liked caddying for him more than I liked caddying for Paul. I love caddying for Paul, don't get me wrong. How much would you pay to play disc golf? And like, to me, that kind of gives me an idea about like what these elite courses, this is where I'm going back to, it gives me an idea about what these elite courses could or should charge. If I was to go to Europe and play the Beast, I would happily play, pay $50 because there you go. that's the experience of it. Yarba, on the other hand, is one of the most beautiful looking courses in the world and it would be a dream to play there. If I had one opportunity, only had to play one round there, I, I honestly would probably pay a hundred bucks. There you just go. Just to say, I've played Yarba Disc Golf Course. hundred dollars. Anywhere else though, I've never looked at another course and said yeah i would totally play that one for me if i can play a free course or i can choose to play a course that's 40 dollars, i will do the, the 40 dollars course every now and ever then. so often yep wow here we are episode number what nine i think nine you would feel like it was episode 13 yeah. the way this evening has been going. I was going to say, I feel like it was episode one with all the technical difficulties that just happened. Everyone, we are a couple minutes behind. To our to our listeners on podcast, yeah. they have no clue. They're like, you're just on time. I just turned it on and I'm starting to listen. But if we were to give you a list, we had to, you know, and I, hey, Johnny V, where are you? Where are you right? Yeah, no kidding. We had to, we were just about to start the show. We had everything lined up and then everything was just stalling and not working so skype, full restart skype completely froze we Get had this. no audio we had our guest connected to us and we are doing some tests right and the test was like going fine and the next thing you know i'm like hey do you see what we just showed and he, and he says no and i'm like what and then one thing led to another and we had to rebuild the whole show so we're glad that you guys are here and we're glad yeah. that you guys were waiting around for us nick We've got a show lined up, and I just want to tease people with the topics, but then I want to get into a little bit of how you're doing. So the okay. topics tonight are going to be talking about uh, premier course design, okay? We have somebody on, and I believe it's probably the most important individual most to have premier. on when we're talking yeah. about that topic. His name's John Houck, and um, besides course design, uh, Hall of Famer, um, we're going to ask a few questions about that. Two-time world champion, let's just tease that out yeah. there. Yeah. Back to back too. Back to back. Yeah. And a former employee slash very high position at the PDGA. <laughs> I don't want to give it away yet because I yeah. don't hundred well, percent know exactly what it means, what he did or anything like that. <laughs> Those are obviously questions for him, but yeah, we'll talk about it. So pretty high great, up. great guest, great guest. And so that's one of the topics and it's going to lead a lot of different yep. conversations around premier course design. We're going to ask him maybe just like we did to um, Chuck last week about would you change hole 18 with the OB and the way it's lined out at Maple Hill? Uh, just interested maybe in his opinion. Chuck said, yeah, he'd get rid of the OB. And I don't know if that's fair to Chuck. He doesn't know maybe necessarily. Well, no, he's played there. Yeah. But anyways, that's a whole other conversation. Would not. And no. I think 99% of the comments we would get <laughs> would also it, it's, it's, not take out the OB. Yeah, there's history there. So um, we're going to do uh, Would You Rather. And people are like, oh, don't give us the Would You Rather segment. We'd rather do the Judge of the Disc Golfer, which we've had some people reach out and say, ratchet ratchet up the comedy factor just a little bit like just barely make fun of them and then i said if we make fun of them no one will interview for the show yeah. or the game so we have some thick skin if you really want you know to be judged so anyways but that will not be tonight i was away in pennsylvania we're going to do the would you rather segment and then finally the last topic or, or it's probably going to lead to this point is how to know when to go pro so like uh, you're in this position. Yep. Um, you were just hanging out with the best professional in the world this week and also Brody Smith, who has also decided to go pro. Mm -hmm. I think you have a lot of insight into this. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah, I think that's going to be a super fun subject. I definitely have some pretty cool things to say about it. And yeah, I did. I did just spend the week with Paul, Hannah, Paul's family, a bunch of our friends, Brody. And um, we talked an insane amount about everything disc golf related. And I think, I don't know, for the next couple of weeks, dude, we got some really good hot takes that, you know, can happen. <laughs> so, okay. So here's, here's something I would like to do is let's go ahead. Last week we had Chuck on and we've never done this portion of like a segment before, but I'm going to give a minute for each of us to discuss our opinion of the ratings discussion last week, which 
there was a whole bunch of topic yeah. co that we didn't get to. There was conversations we had where it kind of left us still kind of like, uh, like w what's with the ratings. And I know you have some opinions on that. And... I don't know if, if I can last, I don't know if I can do it in one minute. Okay. But the I will, minute, uh, yeah. the minute has started. No, but I, Oh, the, for yep. you, for no, you. for you. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, ratings are something that's very important to disc golfers, which I wish it wasn't because, there's just too many different things that there's too many different propagators that I feel as though shouldn't have that much of an impact on everything. But for the most part, ratings in a sense, my favorite thing about the ratings is I look at a player, if he's thousand rated, I think, okay, that guy on paper should shoot one stroke better than me per round. Obviously you can beat that person. They can beat you by more. I know that. But when you look at a lot of tournaments, like Paul's 1062 rated now, I'm 990. I got to think every single round of disc golf, Paul will beat me by seven or more. And every single time I've been in a tournament with Paul, it has been seven or more. 10 seconds left, you know, per round. So like I said, dude, I don't know if I could do it all in a minute, but I'm going to have to. So Matt, take it over. <laughs> so that was minute number one. So after last week, I do. And I told you, I listened to each episode and that was obviously a longer episode and a lot of details involved but i did listen through it and i really tried to think critically about it and two of my takeaways are i was kind of bothered to hear that the ssa is weighted by all the players meaning and chuck even alluded to this you bring in lower rated players to an event like a lot of them it's going to affect the ssa which is the scoring average and in turn affect the rating. So meaning the higher rated players are going to get higher ratings because the lower players are affecting the average of that rated round or that round. Yeah. So it's going to be a higher average uh, score for that round because of the lower player. So because of that, I thought, why not do a weighted SSA, which means take the average of all the players in that division of their ratings, average um, and only count like the top half average. So that way you don't have the lower weighted players affecting the SSA as much so obviously that is uh, there's a whole bunch of discussion there but that's my oh, minute he went over his minute no Guys. i i count, <laughs> I count. minute right no. now so we'll probably talk a little bit more at the end <laughs> just a little bit more about it because i know there's a ton of things but i just really quick i got a comment in our comment section from todd ratings help with sandbagging and i want to say potentially yes but at the same time i do think that ratings should only apply to amateurs like a handicap does in golf I think rating should be only applied to amateurs. And when you hit a certain point, say 991, then 991 or above, then I think ratings should completely go away. But, um, so yeah, no, uh, we'll get along with that. And, um, yeah, so that was our minute talk on the ratings. So let's talk about something that's really big deal in the PDGA world right now is ratings. Yep. What happened last week? that is important to ratings nick two new records were set by the last two people who set their own records and broke them like they seem seemingly do almost every month is now. that rating inflation the reason why paul continues yeah. to get better and better ratings i mean what do you think no paul's just really that good no um yeah no, he uh, no we, we he is though <laughs> and, and same thing with page i mean page Page went up, was it seven or eight points and is now 988 rated? I'm not going to lie. When I saw her rating, I'm like, she's really good. Yeah, exactly. And so Jeff Corns and I, he was out of Virginia with me. We were going through her events last year, just kind of thinking, okay, she needs to shoot this well to keep maintaining that really high quality of play that she's doing. And there were so many events like MVP. She had multiple thousand rated rounds. Uh, GMC, I'm pretty sure she had one or two thousand rated rounds. D glow thousand rated rounds. And it was just like, it's, ins I'm, I'm honestly at this point, I'm surprised that a rating is in nine ninety or above yet, but hold on. And if Chuck's out there, he can comment, <laughs> yeah. but is it, and there's always going to be skepticism. That's probably what makes the rating so cool too. In a way is there's this, there's this debate about it. Yeah. But like if she was playing with, well, no, that's actually, and interesting, actually, both ways. She's playing with lower rated players a lot, too, who are mm -hmm. throwing out of bounds more, et cetera. So anyways, that's a great conversation, but she, uh, congratulations to her. Yeah, absolutely. Highest rated, Congrats, at, highest rated woman ever. And honestly, probably by next month, she is going to beat her record again. I really hope she does. I just, it's cool to see someone doing something incredible in their respected sport. And Paul, 
he just increased his rating, obviously. Yep. And it only was only by one, though. I mean, Paige increased it by like seven or eight. <laughs> and Paul only did one, so so I, Ulti we don't World. Need to talk. <laughs> Ulti World screenshotted a comment on his Facebook post about like, hey, here's my rating, and a, and a commenter, like I want, I don't want to say rightfully so, but asked the question. Is your rating going up because of inflation or do you, Paul, feel like you're actually playing your best disc golf to date? And Paul, in my opinion, kind of replied and not tongue in cheek, but kind of a uh, a fire shot back saying, hey, yeah. if everybody if everybody was affected by inflation, we'd see that going up and I'm the only one that's going up. And I think his intention was to say I'm moving up most like more it's yeah. not inflation yeah. um but ulti world screenshotted that and when i say ulti world let me be clear it's tied to ulti world but it was it was whoever one of their editors is that did this and more or less was like hey here's what paul has to say he doesn't think it has to do with inflations today they made a post that said inflation is a thing and that's interesting because we asked chuck last week and he said no inflation's, inflation's not, not really thing, yeah. so anyways interesting it'll yeah. always be a topic out there so without further ado i i think uh, let's just jump right into inviting our guest on the show. His name is John Hauk. Mr. Hauk, how are you doing, man? Great. It's great to be with you. I told all my social media people this is my new favorite disc golf podcast. Well, thank you. Um, you guys are awesome, and I'm thrilled to be here. Wow. Too generous. Yeah, man. How do we stay humble when people like John Hauk say things like that right. about us? I mean, Wow. I can qualify it for you if you, if you need me to. <laughs> no, do not. That was perfect. We're gonna take that sound bite and add. Guys. We're gonna take the sound bite and add it to our intro. So, okay. so you'll be you'll be a part of our show every part. week. Sorry, don't take out the part where Nick says I'd pay a hundred dollars to pl uh, to play a great course. That needs to stay. Oh, in. absolutely. I stand by. I still stand by that. If I had a chance to go play Yarva <laughs> right now, I'd pay a hundred bucks to do it. Okay. I would too. Good yeah. man. Yes. And so we, we like to have <clears throat> hot takes and we're, we're proud of them and people will tell us what they think about our hot takes, but that's okay. Yeah. So here you are on the show. And honestly, I'm not going to lie. When we have a guest on, I do my research and I was very impressed slash surprised at all of the accolades and accomplishments and the history um, so like, I just want to start with a few and let you maybe comment on some of them. Um, first of all, you grew up in California. Where mm. are you living now? Texas? Well, let me comment on that. Cause I hear that all You're the time. And I guess there's a, I was born there. Okay. Yes. My dad was doing his residency in Long Beach. I think I was about six weeks old when we made the drive Buffalo and I grew up in Buffalo. Oh, all right. Okay, so you totally know. grew up in California, Matt. <laughs> Good research. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say. Oh, I guess I did say grow up. Yeah, that's where he was born. Okay, yep. so you have been in disc sports for I'm going to say a long time. If I do the if I did the math correct, Nick, tell me if I'm doing good with this research. I think it's like 37 years of disc sports. Now, to clarify, disc sports that's 1983. Um, that includes golf, so disc golf, ultimate, and freestyle. Okay. And we teased it out that you're a two-time world champion. Can you tell us about that? Like, what does freestyle look like for you back in the day? Do you still do any of it today? Um, how important was it to you? And the two world championships, how did that come about? Uh, okay, that's like five and one. Yeah, I just, just encompass just it all, whatever you got. Quick just, recap of your life. Just for the record, first tournament, um, 1978, which will be 42 years this year. And um, played, you know, pick up ultimate probably three years before that. So um, it's been it's been a long, long time and all all good. Um, back in my day, if you played disc sports, you did everything. Um, you know, we we all did freestyle. We all did disc golf. We all did maximum time aloft distance. We all did the whole thing. <clears throat> Eventually, people would start to specialize. Um, but. Uh, my main love back in those days was freestyle. Um, freestyle, for those who don't know, is much more athletic than disc golf. Um, I tease people. Um, freestyle is, is started out doing tricks. It was uh, back in the mid-70s. People first learned how to spin it on their finger. <clears throat> and, you know, you put it under your legs and roll it across your arms and make a tricky catch and all that stuff. I, I love that. I mean, I, I loved all of it. 
Um, but freestyle just, you know, it, it just fascinated me. Do you still do, do you still do any of it today? Like if I gave you a freestyle disc, are there still some tricks like riding a bike you could just kind of do? I could, you know, I can do arm rolls and stuff. Okay. But if you need me to do something under my legs, give me about two weeks notice <laughs> so I can start stretching. <laughs> Sweet. When we start our vlogging channel, we'll uh, hit you up. <laughs> we'll give you. I, you know what? Somebody who has become an amazing freestyler in the last few years is Juliana. Corver. She went from queen of disc golf. She's all about freestyle now. Yeah. Um, saw her at a tournament a couple of years ago. And she said, let's play. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay. I can play. And no, I should, I should have had two weeks notice. Yeah. Yeah. So no, she, um, uh, it's, she's on Instagram and she's constant. I think every day, maybe even a couple times a day, she's posting new videos on moves that she is learning moves yeah, that she's yeah. been practicing for a while. And it's pretty incredible because every single video, a majority of it, I shouldn't say that that sounds very mean, but a good amount of it is her showing you how easy it is to fail but yet she does the same thing over and over and over. And then finally at the end, you're like, oh my gosh, that was insane. And so she's right. not just putting out a hundred videos of her doing every single move. And you're like, well, that's crazy. She's actually showing how hard it is to do those moves, which is pretty sweet. We, we, and you yeah. know, we, we have players up here, John, that you actually know from back in the day. And oh. uh, yeah. And I think we even have freestylers up here. I'm trying to remember. I feel like, um, who do we have it? Ken Gary, I don't know if you've ever known him. I, I think he was some type of champion freestyle thrower. But anyways, it is it is a history of disc sports. As you said, if you do disc, you do it all. So um, so you have a career of disc golf. Have you ever done anything else besides disc golf as your career or, or disc sport? Uh, no. When okay. I, I've been very fortunate when I graduated college. Um, I was able to more or less make a living uh, traveling around the country doing shows at fairs and malls and basketball halftimes and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, we did have to call home every once in a while to get a little little extra help. Yeah. Um, but in 1984, I uh, went into business for myself and, you know, I had a had a friend who owned a bar and I, I worked uh, the door at night for a couple of years. But uh, it's been full-time disc, uh, disc sports pretty much my whole life. That's yeah. awesome. I want to give a quick shout out. Dave Jackson, one of the course designers for Maple Hill just jumped in. I think he's excited to hear you as well tonight. So we're going to try to, we're going to try to like saturate ourselves with some of the wisdom <laughs> of John Houck. So welcome everybody to the show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what happened between 1994 and 1996? What was the commissioner's <laughs> role for the professional disc golf association? Is that... I think commissioner, I think NFL, I think Roger Goodell, um, I think PDGA executive director or president was the commissioner equivalent of that in 1994, 1996. Well, in, in some ways, basically, uh, it wasn't until maybe around 1990 that the PDGA actually had the payroll to do administrative things. Um, the board made all the decisions. When you ran for the board, you would you would be elected as commissioner or uh, uh, secretary, et cetera, et cetera. So all the board positions were positions that you ran for. <clears throat> Today, if you make it to being a board member and everybody needs to vote now, mm -hmm. um, then once you're there, they decide who has what positions. Um, but it, the, the board you know, does not typically act quickly. Um, it's all volunteers. Of course, back in my day, we didn't even have email to communicate. So the first step was to get an administrator who, you know, answered the phone, sent out the membership packages, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, during my tenure, I was very fortunate to have um, Becky Woodruff, who became Becky Powell. She did a great job, <clears throat> really helped us right the ship and get the get the PDJ back on track in those days. So I was, you know, the president of the board, the main decision maker, you know, whatever you want to call it. But it was it was the board who made the decisions. Eventually, the PDJ realized we need someone who's there day to day, can make quick decisions. The board gives that person authority to make certain decisions on their own rather than a board vote. 
And so that's what uh, Joe is now and what Brian was before him and, and Brian Henniger before him. So, okay. okay. So let's just continue on through some of these awesome things here. Two time TD of PDGA pro worlds. That's awesome. Do you remember the years on those? Oh yeah. Uh, the same time, actually 94 and 95, both in Port Arthur, Texas, <clears throat> still the only person dumb enough to run pro worlds in consecutive years. So did I just m miss that timeline? That's the same time as you were as the commissioner. Is that, or at least, yeah, 94, 95. Interesting. Uh -huh. So that yeah. was. <laughs> yes. And it, no, and it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the case that I was commissioner and said, okay, I'm going to pick myself as TD. Yeah. Um, Two years in a row. We see what's going on back then. <laughs> yes. Port Arthur really wanted the world championships. Um, there weren't a lot of other bids at that time, which, yeah. you know, sadly, has been the case over the years, you know, yeah. pro world is a, is a big hard job and not, um, necessarily very financially rewarding for the host. So, um, it's, it's hard to get a lot of good places to, uh, <clears throat> to bid on pro world. Anyway, it just, it just all worked out that way. It was who the won worlds thing. those two years. <laughs> Ooh, that's a trivia question. Do you remember that? Well, there was one guy who was winning pro worlds every year at that that's, time. That's what I, that's what I figured. I just wanted to make sure that before I said his that name. One's, that one's pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, one of those years, uh, Mike Randolph came in second and played at that time probably the greatest uh, nine holes of disc golf ever, and made a, a little bit of a run at Kenny in the finals. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was one of my uh, my favorite Port Arthur. Memories and uh, Becky Woodruff won one of those years. Um, I think she beat Annie Kreml on the last hole. Wow. And who won? See, now you guys are putting me on the spot. <laughs> if you I don't always remember, make sure we're to not going to roast you. Yeah, we always make sure I to want, ask uh, one question. I want to say, no, 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 Elaine. Oh, it was okay. Elaine. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure it was Elaine, and I'm pretty sure I posted a. Uh, Throwback Thursday photo uh, not too long ago of me uh, giving her the, uh, the trophy. Nice. That's a little uh, kind of quick intermission really quick. Elaine King is one of my, or excuse me, my friend Hannah. Elaine King is one of her favorite people to play, compete, watch, play disc golf and everything like that. And they actually, I'm pretty sure they just played a practice round. They're having a tournament down in Virginia this upcoming weekend. And I'm pretty sure Elaine and Hannah were able to get out and play a practice round together. So it's pretty cool. Elaine's always been kicking butt in the disc golf world. I think five-time world champion. And uh, it's pretty cool. You're one of the TDs for one of our world championships. Thank you. Elaine, uh, Elaine is awesome. And here's, here's some real trivia. Uh, I think the last sanctioned tournament I played was in Rochester. I could only play Saturday. I couldn't play Sunday. At the end of the day, Saturday... I was tied with Elaine, and so all the Canadian guys and the U.S. guys were calling for a playoff. <laughs> they all <laughs> wanted to bet on because Elaine Elaine yeah. was was living in Toronto at that gotcha. time. Gotcha. Um, we didn't we didn't play it off. It oh. has remained tied to this day. I was gonna so say, Elaine, I guess it's got to happen soon. We'll try to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do here is read off a yep. few more things, then we're going to jump into the Would You Rather, and then we're going to get into this really some good topics here. So you were inducted into the Hall of Fame of Disc Golf um, in 1998. You're the co-founder, this is interesting, of Millennium Golf Discs, the first manufacturer to offer mm -hmm. premium plastics as a standard item. You've mm -hmm. designed over 120 courses. That is an amazing feat. 21 courses for world and national championships. Incredible um, resume there. Um, and so... We're going to get into some of these other topics here, but what we would like to do at this point is jump into this one segment that we call Would You Rather. So we're going to do a little Would You Rather. If you're out there live right now watching, we want to get your feedback on what you would rather. So let's go ahead and pull that up for everybody. Okay, so... Would you rather, Nick, we've got some would you rathers here. Do. I'm looking at my phone at the questions right now. All right, go ahead. Give us the first would you rather. Okay. Would you rather play in windy conditions of at least 20 miles, uh, 20 miles per hour or more or 
a solid, kind of like a moderate rain throughout the whole day. Oh, Not just man. a drizzle, but like a decent amount of rain throughout the whole day. The whole round. So, yeah, man, you've played in both elements, right? Rain and wind. For me, immediately, I'm going to say wind. Almost like hands down, immediately give me 20 miles an hour wind. I personally, that's my kryptonite to throw with rain. So for me, and keeping things dry, it seems just miserable. Wind is miserable for a different reason. Like you feel like shots get thrown you're like i threw a good shot or whatever but like i still don't care for me it's wind what's it for you nick i gotta go with rain to be honest because <laughs> with with wind it's predictable but at the same time it can be very unpredictable when it comes to rain if it's a consistent like you know it's gonna rain you got an umbrella you brought a bunch of towels you're trying to keep your hands dry the best that you can and you can also slow everything down like you don't throw distance drivers on long shots anymore you kind of club it down or excuse me disc down i can't say club down anymore that's a personal <laughs> thing between brody and i he hates it i actually hate it too but anyways disc down you can disc down in the rain um i don't know it's more so predictable. you're just rain you're yeah, rain no, I'm, I'm rain, rain. all the way it can, we're like playing captain planet yeah. here rain wind rain so john what's your answer for that one I would have to say, since my thing as a player, I mean, I was never big distance. I was never great putter. Approaches were always the best part of my game. Um, so if it was weather conditions where, you know, just being able to grind it out, play safe, get your pars, um, that usually worked out well for me. So I would say uh, ideal for me is 20 mile an hour winds with rain. Nice. <laughs> Equalize yeah. the playing field. We down, you know, where I was this last weekend down in Virginia, we were watching this disc golf compilation video of like funny edits and stuff that happens out on the disc golf course. And one of the videos was from Smashbox, and I think it was Derek Billings. He's playing in Vegas. He's shooting on a hole that's going, uh, the basket's on a mound. And I think he takes over 12 on it because every single time he puts or throws, the wind just absolutely grabs it. It's very funny to watch. It's pretty heartbreaking at the same time, but that makes me want to just play in a torrential downpour rather than uh, wind. So if we had caddies, maybe my mind changes yeah. a little bit because I can stay dry. But in general, if it's not more than 20 miles an hour, I'm going with the wind. So, all right, I've got one for you. You Go ready, Nick? You've actually had a little experience with this in some, in some ways. Okay. You've played actually on a live card like with live coverage okay so here's the would you rather would you rather play live on a final round lead card but fall apart shooting the worst round of the tournament in that field that division okay or shoot the hot round putting you in the top 20 as your finish so i have zero experience with that but my answer would be I'm going out in a, a blaze like of glory. Like, put me on the coverage, and I'll shoot the worst round, and people will just be cringing. But as far as marketing goes, people will be very interested in how I finish out the season. I don't know. What do you, what do you got, Nick? Uh, honestly, I yeah, this <laughs> tough. This, I it's but it's not though, because I would okay. take a top twenty finish, uh, shooting the hot round and everything like that, because. I don't know. I've been in some YouTube videos. But how people... did you get on the lead card for the live coverage, though? Like, you had to have shot well. Yeah, but then for the potential thousands of people <laughs> to watch me absolutely shoot the worst round of my life, no, nah, I'm all right. I, dude, I was in a YouTube video this last week, one of the foundation ones, and everyone is just a uh, hot take here. Everyone's just a keyboard warrior <laughs> online. And some of the comments to me, uh, to Hunter, just in general, like, no, I don't need that in front of thousands of people shooting my worst round ever. Absolutely not. No, I'm, I'm taking that top 20 finish shooting the best round of the tournament. And that's not a bad answer. No. I've never been on live and you have, so that you're just like, I don't need that again. Yeah. Did, well, by the see, way, when yeah, you played so live, when by I the played way, live, how did it go? I shot plus five, which Maple, back then, Maple Golds was really hard for me. Now it's just kind of hard. <laughs> it's, it's still pretty hard. <laughs> But no, just back kind then, of hard. Back then, I shot a plus five, and luckily, you know, it's one of my home tournaments. All of my friends were super supportive. Obviously, my family super supportive, so I didn't really get that much crap for it. But it's not anything to brag about. Like, oh yeah, dude, yeah. I shot over par on live coverage. That was no. sick. You, know? you did excellent. I, yeah, I you did good. About, I talk about it with Terry all the time. There but, were yeah, there but, were players who we've seen play live that were local, 
like the feature card, yeah. who did fall apart. So good job Same. to you. No, uh, John, right. in all of your years, it, media is a very big progression and change to the sport. So they didn't have live coverage back then. But they did have video coverage. So would you rather play lead card? That's the question. What do you choose? Well, the good news is that when there was video coverage back in the day, I was usually the one doing the announcing. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have been on a lead card um, where I didn't shoot the worst round ever. But on the last hole, this was uh, a course behind a hotel in San Antonio. The last hole was right by the swimming pool. Pretty much everybody else was already done. They were standing around watching. And I, I literally missed a six-inch putt. With their, I mean, I just like picked up the disc and, and it fell out of my hand before I could get it in the basket. Um, so there's no video record of that, thankfully. <laughs> kind of wish there um, was. Someone find I, it, please. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I think I think Nick nailed this one. I would I would rather have yeah. the hot round. Yeah, and I will say I I did at Worlds. Now this was Am Worlds. So this is only my claim to fame. <laughs> is one of the rounds I was able to shoot or tie the hot round for that the pool that I was in. Which hey. It was a good. It was a good day. I don't think I would have rather been on the top and burned. I just said that for fun today. So Nick, people are still talking about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, Nick. What do you got? Uh, all right. Next one. Play a tournament round in 100 degrees plus or temperatures below freezing, say 10 degrees or lower. Which is actually really funny because someone had just asked that question. Would you rather play in snow or 90 degree heat and humidity? So with that same concept in mind. Yeah. Just as a standard, 100 degrees or, or related close, yeah. okay? Real feel, 100 degrees. Or would you rather play in 10 degrees? Yeah. Well, go, let's go John first. All right, John, what do you think? Hot, hot, or like 10 degrees? I'll take the hot round. Okay. No no problem. Yeah. I mean, I've played freestyle tournaments in 100 degrees, and, uh, you know, it's not ideal, but uh, in Texas, you, you know, it's it's just part of part of living. So. Quick quick side not a big deal. quick sidebar there. You just mentioned like you did freestyle in Texas or wherever it was in the hot heat. Do you think yeah. freestyle is as athletic or more than disc golf, or do you think it's just not he, easy? He to jokingly relate? said it earlier. In, in case in case I wasn't clear, freestyle is far more athletic far. than disc golf. Yeah. So you played that There's in the heat. No, no comparison. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So, Nick, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry, I'm just laughing with John. Um, no, I'm, dude, I'm 100 degree heat all day, every day. I hate playing in the cold. The only reason I do it is because Team Challenge is one of my favorite things to do, which is our winter league here in New England, and uh, that's about the only time that I willingly go out and play in sub freezing weathers. It's no, I hate playing in four layers. I'd rather play in a tank top or. You know. Man, it's such a tough question because I, the layers in the cold, obviously, I can get warm with the layers, but it, it prevents your throwing motions and like the ease there. But the heat is just like exhausting. Uh, I'd rather be exhausted than have my hands swollen because of how cold it is. Okay, it depends. Can we ask this criteria? Is this competition or is this casual play? Same thing. I, no, I'm taking the hot weather. Casual play. I'm going freezing cold oh. because I can actually get more comfortable. But the heat I competition, I would do competition because I feel like I could throw better, but it'd be just it would be exhausting. So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But see, John, I, I was born and raised up here, you know, west of Boston. Yeah. Exactly. yeah I, so I, I, I get it. I hey, get same it. here, but no, I'm, no, no judgment. No yeah, judgment. One million percent playing in the heat. Okay. Go ahead, Matt, with the last All one. right, this is the last Would You Rather before we get into some really uh, cool talk about course designs here. Maybe we can all learn something to become a better course designer. All right, Would You Rather, and this is actually leading us into that topic. Would you rather play a 12,000-foot course? Now, that's obviously, I don't know what the, the long, longest courses are today, but that's got to be it. 12,000-foot or play a par-2 course where all the holes are 150 feet or less. And um, let's go... It, it could be casual. It could be tournament. We're not talking top level here. We're just talking like what if you want to go out and play a round, which are you going to choose? Uh, Nick? I'm going to play in the 100 degree weather, a 12,000 <laughs> foot course. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I've always loved par four style disc golf, par fours, par fives. I love Nantucket. It's one of my favorite courses to go out and play. And uh, I know mm -hmm. it's obviously not 12,000 feet, but no, 12,000 feet. That's my answer. 100%. 
Okay, I'm going to let John have the last word on this one as the course designer, but it depends how I feel when I wake up. Did I have my Wheaties or my oatmeal or what did I have? Like, that is going to be a grueling round, 12,000 feet. If you do the math on that, well, real quick, let's do the math. 12,000 divided by 18 is like, it's, it's averaging 660 foot per hole. Averaging. That, that sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds so fun. <laughs> That's every hole you're just like, throwing it as hard as you can which is cool because you're like you said it's par four probably because you're gonna have your upshot so uh if i had to choose it depends how i feel waking up i think i would have more I, actually I, this is way too tough for me i don't know um, i also i want it all in the not all in the woods but i want a majority of it in the woods i don't want to play a Twelve thousand foot course that's wide open. That's okay. boring as heck. Okay, but... that's a good criteria. Sorry, that's no, that kind of changes oh, my mind. Actually, someone just commented that too. <laughs> Is the wooded. twelve yeah. thousand feet wooded? Yes. So okay, that's a great clarifier because for me, if it's wooded, yes, I'll play the twelve thousand foot because it actually does sound really fun now. Yeah. <clears throat> and some people are like, that sounds fun, but yes, I think it sounds that's fun. A, that sounds if it's good blast. course design, if it's good course design, yeah. and all the holes are long. Wait, how long is like a uh, iron? What is it? Iron Hill? Iron Hill. I'm not sure. I can try to look it up quick, though. Anyways, that's a lot of woods and long holes. So, John, what would your answer here be? As a course designer, you wake up. What do you want to play? Oh, it depends how I feel when I wake <laughs> up that day. Uh, I think, I mean, you guys know I do courses where, I mean, 12 or 13 holes are 600 feet or more. So I'm amazing. all about that. And if you... You know, if, if you had a few more par fives to to jack it up, then you can make it to 12,000. I, I would go with uh, not all wide open, 12,000 feet, four of the holes are 150 feet long, and the par fives are all downhill. <laughs> okay. So we when we all add our own criteria to it, we can come up with a way for any of these. But that, this is a good topic. I thought that was fun, would you rather? So people, someone else said, do we get a golf cart? All these things are factors for sure. But um, so course design, let's literally just get right into it. You, you've designed over 120 different courses and that's no joke. Um, I know that we talked to Chuck last week. He's designed over 100 as well. Um, there's between you two, I mean, that's so many courses. We are really glad to have you on. Let's um, let's find out what what's good with course design. So I've played Nantucket, which is an island off of Massachusetts. Um, I've also played Hillcrest. By the way, Wikipedia people, punch in John Houck Wikipedia. You can see everything we're going to talk to him about tonight. You can see all the courses he's designed, um, or at least the notable ones. I don't think all... 120 are there. Maybe they are. Um, but Hillcrest in Prince Edward Island up in Canada. And I'm going to say right now, I, I think I'm going to say, this is a would you rather question. I'm going to say I would rather play Hillcrest than almost any other course, maybe besides Yarva. That's a dream yeah. to get out there. But Hillcrest, then, and, and I'm, I'm obviously like ungrateful. I live here at Maple Hill in Leicester. So, like, I get to play it all the time. Like, every week I'm playing it. So, like, to me, right now, I'd say I'd rather play Hillcrest than Maple Hill. That where, is a very is hot take. Again? That's a very hot take. Where is that one? <laughs> um, that's up in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Oh, that's right. That's right. We okay. actually had John. We had people live comment here saying that that is, I think they even said it, their favorite course. Um, and they wanted us to ask you about it. So, do you want to just start with that? How did Hillcrest start? What, what, what happened there? How did you get that call? How long did it take? <laughs> Just give us the down low. And, and how proud of you are, are you of that course? Canadian National Championships happened there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, <clears throat> I love that course. I was very privileged to get to, to work with the best family on that property. Like most courses that I've done um, since 2005, it started with them having uh, a call with my wife, Dee, who is the brains of the operation. She's the idea person. She is the best educator um, in disc golf when it, when it comes to course design and talking to clients. Um, and I, let me just riff for 10 seconds because she's the one who had the idea for how design and people 
people who have taken our workshops know that she has done more than anybody else to really create a profession of course design. Um, she's she is an unspoken hero of disc golf, and I, I hope someday she'll get the the credit that she's due because she's amazing. Well, I'm shout uh, out to D then. I met her out absolutely. at Nantucket, and you're right. Yes, yes, and she's done so much to to uplift the sport. People people see things that I that we do and say, oh look what John did, but most of the time, no, it's something that D did. So um, cool. she worked with uh, Bill and Mary Best to to set it up. Um, it's a magical place. Um, I mean, the whole the whole island is. The property itself is amazing. The uh, best family takes tremendous pride in the maintenance of the course. So, <clears throat> I mean, to me, strictly from a design standpoint, um, Nantucket and Hillcrest are kind of in the same family, but. Um, Hillcrest has just all kinds of natural blessings. Um, I mean, when we started in Nantucket, I said, okay, we need to try to make the best pancake flat course in the world. Right? <laughs> There's right, one yeah. hole with elevation, right? There's one hole. Hole eight, hole eight goes down like 15 <laughs> feet and hole nine comes back up 15 feet. But I mean, other than that, no. Are those the two um, par threes? Hillcrest, yeah. yeah. What's that? The, those are the yeah. two par threes. One's a little mid-range. Yeah, they're both kind of mid-range, just downhill, then uphill. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so they're they're both beautiful, but Hillcrest Farm is is uh, you know a beauty at one of the highest levels in all of disc golf, and like I said, they take great care of it. Um, <clears throat> and you may know that this was going to be the third year that they had Canadian Nationals there, mm -hmm. and since that course, like Nantucket, was really designed for blue level players, right? So average, you know, 925 to 975. Um, so if you shoot about a 950 on either of those courses, um, you're gonna be right about par, but it's not really made for the best players in the world. So <clears throat> the plan was that by now I would have been up there and uh, we would have had, you know, we'd be making great progress on Hillcrest Gold right now to okay. make it more of a challenge for uh, for the best players in the world. And I don't know if you heard, there was this crazy virus thing earlier in the year. And, yeah, uh, I don't know. We've just been, been sitting here doing and podcasts and brainstorming <laughs> ideas for the last three, four, five, six, however many months it's been. But no, yeah. yeah. That's, that's why this show is born. Yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. We got bored COVID twiddling actually, our thumbs. Yeah. No, that's yes. pretty incredible. I was thinking in my head, you know, Nantucket has one of the best tournaments all year. And then the Canadian Nationals tournament over the last few years have been, has been labeled as one of the best tournaments all year. And a lot of pros choose whether to, you know, are you making the trek up to the Canadians or are you staying down here, going to the island and playing the Nantucket Open? It's pretty cool that you design both of those courses. You're, you're even designing Prince Edward Island's course, Hillcrest, to be even harder, to make it more challenging, and probably is going to be – pros are going to love it, you know. That's great. Well, we hope. We hope. And, you know, the thing – it's it's the truth is it's hard for me to watch the best players in the world – on courses that are designed for basically 950 players. Yeah. Let's talk about and, that. Let's talk about that because okay. you've mentioned it twice Let's, now. Let's talk about when you design a course. I hate ratings talk. <laughs> no, we're I'm not going to talk ratings. Just ratings are an average. <laughs> ratings are an average. Um, and Chuck, Nick's joking. He doesn't He doesn't hate ratings talk. Chuck's, oh, I, Chuck's in here. <laughs> yeah. so, so listen, you when this is the inception of disc golf design, a client or a, a park or whoever it is, however you want to refer to them, reaches out to you and their initial contact is, hey, I want a disc golf course. Your, your uh, first question that you ask, obviously you probably have, you know, forms and all this, but more or less the first question is like, what are we creating this for, right? I mean, is that where you start? Well, yes. And like I said, that, that conversation is typically one that they're having with D. Um, cause she's, like I said, she's, she's so good at, at, uh, helping understand what they want and helping them understand what we do. Um, so yes, it, and, and, you know, every once in a while, somebody will say, you know, I want the hardest course in the world, or I want it to be gold. And it, it doesn't make sense to make a course that's day to day all the time gold, right? That's going to challenge the best players in the world, unless you have 
other configurations mm -hmm. that are going to be good for everybody else. So, for example, we want to take Hillcrest and make a Hillcrest Gold. Harmony Benz um, has has a gold version, and it's in Strawn Park, so we call that turning Strawn into gold. Um, and last year at the Mid America Open, um, uh, Emerson Keith, who was at that time just starting a run of just burning it up, and was gonna, you know, was about to take the lead at Worlds. Um, he shot a course record eight under, um, which was rated 1051. He, over three rounds, he averaged 21 under. Um, and I think other than one 20 foot putt, he went bogey free. So I'm not crazy about the fact that he was able to go pretty much bogey free, yeah. but the fact that, um, you know, averaging seven under is enough to win a tournament like that, that that's you know that tells me that we're we're in the right area where we have gold. I had a conversation, uh, a brief conversation with Paul and Simon on hole 16 at Nantucket, which, if I remember correctly, is where I talked to you for the first time, Matt. I think you were waiting to tee off on hole 16, right? The benches are there. The, the you can people get that. to watch. I was just hole. talking about that at the beginning of the show. Your memory. Sorry. Do people comment on that? Because, and I'm sorry to interrupt midstream there, but do people comment on your ability to remember names and places like that? Because to me, that's more on the difficult side. And you were able to, before I introduced myself recently <laughs> to get this interview, you remembered me from Nantucket. And that just was, that's impressive to me. <laughs> well, um, let's, let's give some of the credit to you because you're an impressive guy. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that stuck with me, other than the fact, you know, he's got a beard. I like that. He's a good looking guy. Kids disc golf, I, I, I thought was great. So that made awesome. a real impression on me. And so <clears throat> at the same time, uh, forgive me, Nick, if I met you at the same time. And Wait, I didn't... No, 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 no. So I, Matt was asking, he's like, have you ever met John? And I was like, so I played the Nantucket Open, I think back in 2017. And I think you had you may have been talking to Paul and I think I brushed by in conversation, but we've never formally introduced you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll go with that one. Yeah. No, I don't think we've ever formally been introduced with each other. So during pandemic, what better way to do that than on a podcast? Okay. So we interrupted you. Whole yep. 16. So we're going back whole 16. Yeah. There fist we go. Bump. So right, you so saw Simon 16, there. Right. So Paul and Simon were waiting to tee off. And I, I said, guys, I just want you to know it's so hard for me to watch you play these 600 foot par fours, you know, because they're not designed for you in this particular venue. We don't have the opportunity to make it longer. Um, and Paul said, and I, I think I'm pretty close here. Uh, Paul said, I think this course is just about perfect for the women. I will, I will, I will back that up because I actually was there for that conversation. That is oh, almost, were? that is almost a direct quote. You're right. That's literally perfect. FPO. Perfect. Yeah. Right. And it, because it's, you know, it's meant to challenge people around 950 and that's, um, that's not a rating thing. That's just a yeah. convenient number we use to describe that skill level. Yeah. And anyway, then, then the kicker is, well, Simon says, I don't know. I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's trying. He's trying to go over the top yeah. of everything and 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 deuce these six hundred foot holes. So yeah. right, it um, feels good to eagle a hole. So you start with a player in mind when you create a course, and the majority of your courses that might be hard to specify for you, but the majority of your courses are they probably focused on that. Um, skill level? Are you looking at the amateur, the, the amateur level, like 950, 930? Like, is that typically your course design standard? Well, start? that's, yeah, it, again, it depends on the client because I've, I've done a bunch of nine hole courses where all the holes are, you know, average 200 feet. Um, and it just depends on what the property is like, what the, the playing population is like, what their goals are like. Um, but, you know, most of the people who come to us want to have something that's going to bring people into town, mm -hmm. um, you know, something that, that they can consider a, a feather in their cap, something their town can be proud of. But <clears throat> as much as possible, we want every course to be as playable as possible for every skill level. So if you look at the red tees at Nantucket, 
where the par threes are 200 feet and the par fours are 400 feet. So if somebody's just getting started, as soon as they can throw 200 feet accurately, they're, they're going to be, be able to score on that course. Um, I saw a great post somewhere by a guy who said, I went to play Harmony Benz in uh, Columbia, Missouri, and I ran into a local who said, this is the only course he's ever played. <laughs> Right. And it's it's the same thing with the red tees there. Yeah. The, the It's it's a huge park and a huge course. But the red tees, 200 feet on the on the par threes, um, 400 feet on the par fours and about 600 feet on the par five. So um, it, it especially if somebody's coming into the game without any preconceptions, as you would have in golf. Yeah. Right. I mean, golf. The courses are all, you know, total length within a certain range, par within a certain range. Fairway widths tend to be within a certain range. And in disc golf, I mean, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, so for somebody who's never played before and that person goes out to Harmony Bends and is playing these 200-foot holes, 400-foot 400 400 par fours, they don't necessarily consider it a big deal. Do you think... It's important when you're creating a course. Now, this is for all the other aspiring course designers out there. Do you think it's important to create um, a shorter alternative to the original course design is how I'm thinking of saying it. So like you said, Nantucket, you created a course and then you created a shorter course on that same layout. Um, because I feel like when you're designing a course, you're designing it for a specific range but you might be missing out on, a, I don't want to say a demographic, but a skill level of player, a new family that wants to come out. Are you trying to capture as much as you can? So is it easy to create just the second or you think that, no, one's fine? Or is it just limited literally based off of time and money? Well, I mean, time, time and money are always a factor, but you want that family to be able to come out and play, you know, in, in almost every case, I don't, I don't think I know of any course where they said, well, we don't want anybody who's never played before, right? We only want to cater to mm -hmm. experienced players. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I will say, cause I, you know, I got to give credit where credit is due. Um, D has created something called micro disc golf courses, um, which are, um, uh, they're not putter courses. They're not recreational courses. She's she's already put them in, I think, five or six states, and they're they're just getting a huge response. But some holes may only be 30 feet long, and there's rarely a hole uh, longer than 200 feet. So that is something where if you've never um, played disc golf before, and I mean, you're I uh, I saw somebody. Um, who, who got their first ace ever on like a 20 foot hole <laughs> and, you know, huge, huge celebrations. Yeah. Right. Um, and the first course, the first micro course that she put in, uh, the last hole was, I, I don't know, 45, 50 feet long. And within the first week, somebody posted a video on Facebook of a two and a half year old kid who got up there, rolled the sidearm all the way up to the pin nailed the you know six foot putt or whatever it was yeah. and everybody went crazy so um there's all kinds of ways to get disc golf into the um into the lives of people of every age and every skill level and you know like i said you never know if you if you're going to a course you've never played before you never know what you're gonna yeah. what you're gonna see until you get out there um and that's that's part i think of of one of the real appeals of disc golf one of our one of our comments that just came in was <laughs> putt putt for disc golf now i call it you know mini golf but as some of those holes yeah when you have a 20 30 foot hole like to a large majority of us we're going to think of that as you know oh yeah i'm just putting on this hole but for someone who's never played before when you bring a newcomer into the sport and they're like oh what you know what discs should i go out and buy should i be getting this nuke or you know these fast stable drivers and you're like, no, learn how to throw a putter first. And I think, you know, these micro courses that D is coming out with, I think is an incredible idea because you have holes that are 50 feet. When you can learn to throw a putter straight for 50 feet, you've accomplished something pretty good. And now keep working at that and get it to 60 feet, to 70 feet, to 80 feet. You know, I, I think that's an awesome idea. How much? Yeah. I, I yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, give us the elevator speech on these micro courses. So if anyone's interested in it, but... It sounds like the elevator speech is what we just discussed. Is that good enough or is there anything else you'd like to share on that? 
Well, anybody who is interested in micro disc golf, give us a call, talk to Dee, she'll educate you. And, and you know, part of it came from the fact that, um, you know, she realized that a lot of people come to us and they don't have enough acreage for a real disc golf course uh, or they don't have the budget for a real disc golf course. And a micro course, I mean, it gets disc golf into these areas where they might not be. Now we've got facilities. Um, I mean, I can think of two right off the top of my head where we're putting in a championship course and a micro course. Um, and, and, and let me not forget to say, even experienced players love um, just getting out and, you know, being yeah. able to play 10 quick rounds on the five hole micro course. They, yeah. they, go, they go nuts for it. There's a course yeah. up in Maine. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I thought you were yeah. going to say the same one, actually, but then you yeah. said Maine. Well, what about Pyramids or Marshall Street Disc Golf? Yeah, Pyramids came out with the Pinks. Um, Maine Pink layout, at yeah. Sabatis has the course called the Owl. Yes. I'm pretty sure it's lit for 24 hours a day, so you can go play it whenever. But I'm pretty sure when U.S. Women's was there, um, I was hanging out because Paul and Hannah were there. And I'm pretty sure we played a couple rounds just quickly running through. I forget how many holes it is, but quickly running through the owl, which is pretty awesome because holes were, you know, I don't want to butcher it, but let's say <laughs> 70 feet to I think the most was 200. Yeah. And then um, f um, New England Disc Golf Center just put up, is it the Meadows? Something like that. It's a little par three course, also 12 or 13 holes. Kyle, Shane, and I went out there. And I think Kyle and I at least played like four or five rounds after playing the big course <laughs> because fun. it was just fun. Yeah. You just go through, you bring three discs with you, you practice your putting, your upshots. And I, I love that idea. And I here's what I like cool. about it too is, and I, I don't like to hit on my soapbox often for kids disc golf here on this show, but I'm, I, I, against is a strong word. I don't like the idea of changing basket sizes or disc sizes for young players or even new players. Mm -hmm. The idea of a junior sized basket is, is not interesting to me. I've thought it through. Uh, I don't promote it. I think it actually makes it harder in a lot of ways, which is interesting. So anyways, a very cool idea, micro disc golf courses. I I'm totally supportive of that. And uh, I think that's excellent. I, I wish I could say I thought of it, but I would be <laughs> shout out to D once again. Idea. All right. We'll have D on oh, the show yeah. next. Yeah. All right. Yeah. John, you're out. D D's coming on now. Okay. <laughs> so with that being said, let's ask this question. Um, how much, well, you may not want to disclose your dollar amounts and all that, but what is the highest cost for a disc golf course that you've ever put in? And I'm talking like just the whole package deal, the turnkey. Mm -hmm. You got the request and it is done and here's what the, the total amount was. Well, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you that that's easy and it, the total budget is not a reflection on what we got paid for that <laughs> project. Um, and it's, all, it's also public knowledge, it's out there on the, on the internet. Um, Parc de Fami, uh, which is just south of New Orleans in Jefferson Parish, um, the budget on that one was north of $600,000. And a lot of that uh, went to work that they had to do on the property to make sure that it drained properly, mm -hmm. right? Because there, it's the, the course, there's a canal that goes through there, and the course is just about the same level as the canal. Um, that course is just about as flat as Nantucket is. So for them to be able to find ways that that course would not hold water every time it rained, um, that was a big deal. So a, a lot of that went to engineering. Um, now, that being said, they also did a great job clearing it. There was a lot of clearing involved. But it, it's another example of how <clears throat> disc golf can fit into an area that's not really appropriate for anything else. I mean, you wouldn't put soccer fields there or, or ball fields or some other thing. Um, and it, you know, it was a lot of money, but they, they wound up with um, a beautiful course. By the way, and a part of it also was uh, one of the, the uh, drainage issues was every fairway, they put six to eight inches of sand. I mean, coast to coast, 20 foot wide fairways, 50 foot wide fairways. It's all six to eight inches above everything that's around it. And then once they were done, 
uh, they put grass seed in. And man, when it when that seed uh, first came up and everything was brand new, I have never seen a disc golf course that looked more like a ball golf course than that was wow. Ab- wow. absolutely beautiful. That's pretty awesome. So, yep, yeah, next that, time. That's really anybody, cool to think of. Where does, yeah. in, that, in that situation, this is a course design question, in that mm-hmm. situation, where does the majority of the budget go to? In that one, it sounds like the landscaping. But maybe you can just speak in a general sense. If you're going to design a course, I know they're all different. But if you're going to design a course, where does the majority of a budget go to? Um, depends on the property. If it's wooded, most of the budget's going to go to clearing. Um, you know, the, the type of fairways that I would consider world class are wider than uh, most courses you're going to see in the woods. They're going to have more options than what you see in the woods. Um, and that all is a, that all is a lot of work. Um, but every project, you know, depends on what kind of resources are available as well as um, what they're looking to do. You know, if it's a parks department and they have, you know, their own crews in-house, and so that's not as much of a big ticket item at a private facility where they're having to bring in a contractor or that kind of thing. Um, it all just depends. But if it's a wooded course, um, you know, I, I would say clearing is is almost always the number one budget item. Well, because you know what, yeah, you know what baskets are going to cost. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Okay. Nick, do you, you have anything to follow up there? No, I'm just... Signs, at, T-pads are going to cost. Yep. Well, T pads. So. That's exactly where that was one of my next question. T pads. So, okay. what do you consider as a professional course designer to be a good T pad? That's question one. And I'm going to let you talk a lot about this. So, that's question one. What would be a good T pad? And then, two, when it comes to competition, do you think that there should be a regulation standard for T pads? So, first, what's a good T pad? And then, do you think there should be a regulation standard. Well, uh, as long as I've been in the sport, we've been looking for the perfect tee pad surface. Um, and in the last few years, you know, turf looks like maybe it's going to become a decent option. Uh, you know, we've experimented with rubber. Rubber has done great in Nantucket for all these years. Yeah. Um, but there's other places where rubber isn't working out so well. Um, I, I hear a lot of mixed reviews on turf. Some people love it. Some people hate it. So in my book, you know, concrete is still king. If you can get a nice, flat, concrete tee pad, um, you, have, you make sure, you know, there's no drop-offs anywhere. So nobody's going to twist an ankle or anything. Um, and you make sure it has... A a rough enough surface um and uh, you know not everybody's going to love concrete (laughs) but i think um all things considered because you know turf turf also um uh, seems to come with maintenance issues right having to put the sand or whatever it is and and replace it every once in a while not to say that concrete is perfect when it comes to maintenance issue but um, I, I hope someday we'll, we'll find something where we clearly the best way to go, but you know, until, until that day, um, there are, there are good options out there, but I'm, I'm still a concrete guy, um, which <laughs> by the way, there, there's a longer story behind this, but the first time we discussed that with the representatives of the state of Massachusetts, um, about, uh, the Nantucket course. Um, at a dinner where we had, you know, maybe half an hour of, of small talk. And then uh, our good friend Todd Rainwater said something like, so y'all are good with concrete, right? And I swear to God, some of them actually pushed back away from the table. But we don't like to discuss the C word. <laughs> that's, that's so <laughs> funny, actually. Wow. Right. So, and you guys know, you know, pavers can be a good option, right? Yeah. You, yep. I mean, you, I you do have love them at Maple Hill. Pavers at Maple Hill. Right. So yeah. there, you know, if you if you do them right, I don't see why um, pavers can't be a good option too. If the so, tea pa- yeah, go ahead. Um, you asked me yes, to make the, this a long the fo- answer. No, yeah, no, the follow up is on the standard. Should there be a standard set for PDGA? I mean, a PDGA standard for T pad. Yeah, I think so. I mean, <clears throat> and I think I think there there are some already. If you if you look at the PDGA guidelines on you know 
what you have to have before they'll even consider an A tier, an NT, or a or a major. There's some of that in there. Um, I <clears throat> personally um, prefer a T that is wider in the back for people who come in at an angle. Um, I saw Nico doing some of that recently. You know, a lot of shots where where he was starting off the tee box, um, not. Not that it, there was any problems. This was at the preserve, I think, because yep. the you know there was good grass, good level grass all the way around. But some people like to come in at an angle, so I like to you know widen it out as long as the front of the tee is wide enough, make it a little wider in the back. Um, and on a championship course, we uh, on the long tees always have a minimum of twelve. Um, some places like Harmony Bends are fifteen. Um, I think Agape, which is the course uh, that should open in Pennsylvania later this year, I think they're going to be 15. And, you know, some people, you, you, 30 feet wouldn't be long enough. But, you know, yeah, no players, kidding, right? players yeah. appreciate. Who comes to mind? Who James, comes to mind? James Conrad. <laughs> James Conrad. So real quick, Bill Newman. I know you know the man. He just commented on here a little while ago. said, what's up, Johnny Hot? So is that a nickname you've had? Johnny Hot? <laughs> Uh, that that is that is one of them. Hi, Bill. Um, I, I, I'm gonna say it. I know it'll it'll probably ruin his career. But B, Bill and I have been good friends since I think 1980, um, when I first met him at the Massachusetts Overall Championships, um, and he's he's done a lot for disc golf. And <clears throat> hot um, was was uh, probably the greatest superlative in the. Um, freestyle were back in those days, oh. probably by the mid eighties, it was heinous okay. or hain. Um, but yeah, so hot, hot was the word back then. And Johnny hot was a, a, a term of endearment and respect. So that is thank awesome. you, Mr. For the, for the back-to-back -back world champion. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to decide which is a better question here. We can either go the <laughs> route of What's your favorite basket? And are you at liberty to say that as a as a private, you know, you don't have any sponsorships here, like uh, favorite basket. And yeah, I guess we'll just ask you that. Do you, do you have a favorite basket that you'd like to put in at courses? Um, we typically leave that up to the client. Um, there are a lot of great baskets out there. You know, we've done a lot of courses lately with a Mach X that I know a lot of people just love. Um, of course, you can't go wrong with the with the disc catcher. Um, I don't actually have a lot of experience uh, with too many of the other ones, but if we had a client, uh, well, Hops Farm uh, had one of the original sets of Prodigy baskets, okay. um, which I, I think everybody acknowledges had some problems at the time, but they are well past those. So there's, you know, when you get into that upper upper tier. Um, there's just a lot of, a lot of good options. I don't know. Do you, um, yeah, exactly. People, but, um, yeah. There's... Do you do elevated baskets? Like, is that a, something that you incorporate into your design, like hanging and elevated? Um, not a fan. Um, unless it's, you know, if it's on a mound or, or, or what I would consider a natural feature, that's great. Um, I just, you know, and this is just me, no no um, uh, judgment on anybody else who does it. When you, when you build something up and put a basket on it, that just feels a little too artificial for me. Um, so I don't, I don't do it. But Harmony Benz, you know, is a great example where we had the opportunity um, on hole 12, which is otherwise flat, to, to you know, uh, we had the dirt available to make a nice big mound, actually two of them. Uh, one for the day-to-day -day basket and one for the gold basket. <clears throat> and, you know, I just I just prefer to, to do it that way. So, you know, the fact that people would be putting up at something, yeah, that's, that's um, something that should happen. That's part of the variety of the course. And, of course, you know, if, anytime you're, you're having to put that nose up, right, wind becomes more of a factor. I think that, that adds some interest yep. to it. And my personal preference is just I'd rather do it um, with earth than so, with yeah. wood. Or stones so or before before Nick gets into his point here, I want to say I played a course. I was just traveling and I was in Pennsylvania. It's not a John Houck design course. Don't worry. 
And I, I say, don't worry, because what I'm about to say, I would rather be playing a John out. And there was one putt on this hole. They had a almost a standard size, like basket with the pole height and everything. But on top of a stump that was like six feet tall. So they actually had right. a ladder, a ladder to climb up as high as the stump was so you could reach into the basket. I was probably just inside the circle for a putt and I felt like I was putting like straight up and yeah. it was just That's as insane. you said it's like if it was on a mound maybe but even that would feel gimmicky if you're that close to the basket and it was that elevated so I appreciate your input if on that I, I could see if it's like a slight kind of upgrade to the mound not just one all of a sudden where you have this huge <laughs> huge mound right in front of you but if it was slightly like slowly elevating I don't think that would be terrible. I, you know, I kind of like the aspect of, you know, you're putting uphill at something. There is that, risk reward to that putt. No, that's that's a great comment. And, and let me clarify on that. I'm not talking about a mound that's five feet wide and you yeah. stick a basket on top of it. Right. Uh, the, the mound at uh, Harmony Bends, I want to say, is at least as big as the circle. And so that yeah. allows you as you have a better shot right to mm -hmm. be more at the level of the basket so it's it's a little extra reward for being close to the pin yep. um so as you're as you're farther out you're putting up a little higher and it's and it's i don't know i think it's maybe three feet tall so it's not crazy in um yeah in any case so but that's, yeah, I'm that's glad, not too bad to play at all that. but when you have a mound or an elevated basket like you're talking about matt you know even you just being inside the circle there are times where you're potentially thinking, especially if it's a tournament, I got to lay this up now because I'm not 15 feet away putting straight up. You know, that's just not – if you're yeah. inside the circle, you know, the only time I'm really laying up is if there's water directly behind it, you know, whatever. But um, kind of one of the last things we want to talk about, what what makes a course great as a course designer? <laughs> what what really makes it pop? Yeah, what's um, the ingredients? Well, you, you, you have to start with, with a good property, right? So we always want um, mature trees uh, whenever we can get them. And if you're talking about the best of the best, that's mandatory. Um, interesting terrain at, at this point is also going to be mandatory. Um, and to me, uh, water features, if you're going to be best of the best, that, that needs to be part of the equation too. So, um, and you know, you guys know, and I, I guess we're not going to go there this week and that's okay. We can. I'm not a we can. fan of, I'm not a fan of artificial OB. Um, I work very, very hard to get away from that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at Sela Ranch, which has hosted, you know, uh, amateur world doubles for many years, a major, uh, there's no rope out there except around the water features. Same at Harmony Bends. Um, and so <clears throat> I would rather work harder to, to reward and give incentives to people without having to do that. You know, maybe there are cases where you have no other options and you have to do it, but I, I think your course is better, um, if you're not putting down rope. Wow. Um, that's that's also that was Chuck's take. And I'm just going to say, I always love to hear perspective to help gain my perspective, like to help me bring me to a good place. And I feel like two individuals who have created over 100, 200, 300 courses to say that they're not a favor of artificial. I'm going to tell you, I actually I liked it and I thought it was great. Like I play Maple Hill and in my mind, I'm like, this is a challenge and really tough and I love it. But to hear people saying to people who I'd look up to in course design to say the opposite, starting to make me consider my perspective on it. So I appreciate you sharing that. Okay, well, good. That's a that's a good start. And I'm, I'm sure have you you'll... played have you played Maple Hill? I took a tour of Maple Hill. We were in the area, didn't have time for a round. Yep. Um, and, and D sat in the front of the easy go <laughs> and I stood on the back and I think it was Tom who took us around. He was very generous. Uh, Steve wasn't there that day. Um, but, um, <clears throat> no, it's, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, lot to love about Maple Hill and I don't, and I don't want to no. not discuss Maple Hill, but let me, <laughs> let me finish the original question yeah, if, if I can. So, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you have to have a great property you have to have great um, development, 
which is, you know, the people who you, you got to clear it right. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the day that um, they had just finished removing the last stump from Nantucket and players were going, there isn't a single stump on this course. I mean, how, how often does that happen? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so that's, you know, and you go to Harmony Bends and there are these retaining walls um, on hillsides that create landing areas and tees and greens. And, and so that kind of stuff um, goes a long way. And then as far as the design, <clears throat> um, to me, you know, giving the players options so that there is strategy involved, so that it doesn't play the same way all the time. Um, you know, bringing more uh, thinking into the game, that's a big big part of what I think makes a great course. It takes a lot more work, especially in the woods, but that's, you know, that's uh, where I'd like to see us get as much as possible. Um, and giving people the opportunity to recover when they make a mistake. Um, now, you, you have some of the most unforgiving rough in the disc golf world in Nantucket. That's, you know, that's just part <laughs> yeah. of the deal. I the walked away not be with, too open. Yeah. I walked away with poison ivy and like some scratches, yeah. but, right. but I can, never I mean, leave. You can easily lose a disc. Yes. And you lose a disc, but you're coming back next year or whatever for the big tournament. Exactly. But, it's I never leave with the I always leave going that was awesome the the, the tournament and the course. So well, good. what what uh, other ingredients? But, right, but that course um to to some extent you can make a mistake and and you still have the opportunity to recover but a lot of holes you make a mistake and you're just out of luck. So I think it's it's important to to be able to make it so that if somebody's a little bit off the fairway um, they can still make a great shot and get back in, right? That happens in golf, mm -hmm. right? They have a, a they have a short cut and then a little longer cut. They have sand traps, and if you get yourself in trouble, you have the opportunity to make a great shot and still save your birdie or save your par. And we need we need more of that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so to be honest with you, <clears throat> I have a vision that I'm hoping to get to in the next year or two. Um, of a course that takes all the best features from Sela Ranch and Harmony Bends and Hillcrest Farm and Frost Valley, which doesn't get much attention, but I think is also in that category, and um, Agape, which I think will be in that category, and Hickory um, Hickory Cabins in Kentucky, which will be in that, and 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 you know to have the resources, and this is where. Um, I don't expect it to, to be a hundred dollars around, um, so don't don't worry about that, Nick. Hey, but I, it might be if it's that beautiful, I'll pay it. I'll pay it one yeah, time. Well, one time. A special a one time. Yeah. Okay. Well, special special rate just for you. Awesome. Um, but but it but it it would it would be more expensive to create than most courses out there. It would have to cost more than most courses out there, and maybe it's a hundred dollars for the weekend, not a hundred dollars around. But I think you can take the best of all those courses and then ramp them up another notch. I mean that's. That's the vision um, that I have now, and that's that's where I want to get to now. <clears throat> and and then actually, I have a vision for what comes beyond that, um, the next step. So I, I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of great courses out there. I think we can do better. I think we're going to do better. And um, you know, it's almost unlimited um, what we're what we will be able to do with this golf once we have. Um, uh, more access to great land, which, which is happening more and more yeah. and more access to, um, to, to bigger budgets to make it happen. Um, and like I said, there, there are a lot of design things that I've wanted to do. Uh, I mean, <laughs> some things for 20 years that I haven't had the opportunity to do until the last few years. Um, but there are other things that I'm still waiting for the opportunity to do. So I, I think the, the future is, is, uh, right. is pretty exciting. Yeah. It, it's crazy to think, you know, one of the most world renowned course designers is on the podcast right now, Matt. And, you know, I'm kind of getting like goosebumps thinking about a course that potentially would be a hundred dollars for the weekend. And I say that because we're almost at that spot. We've talked about it for weeks on weeks is, you know, when is disc golf, disc golf going to hit that next step? And 
in ball golf, the courses are super expensive. You know, it's 60 bucks to play one round or a hundred bucks to play a round. And that's on the cheaper side from what I heard. And I, I don't really know golf, but I was talking with Brody about it. And I was like, yeah, Hey, Kettle Brooks right down the road from my house. It was $60 to play there around assignment. And he was like 60 bucks. And it's a nice course. Holy, <laughs> holy cow. And I'm like, shoot, that seemed expensive to me, but imagine, you know, going to a disc golf course where it's so incredibly awesome. All the ideas that John is talking about and it's $60. Do and any people, of you, you know, like, I'm just like, shoot, sign me up. Come on, let's go. Let's get that course going. I I'm, I'm ready to play it, but quick. Right. So one of the, one of the great things about this golf and, and one of the reasons it's grown as much as it, as it has is because it's almost always free. Yeah. So, exactly. and, and anytime we start having this conversation, there are people who are going to go, no, 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 no. But I think, I don't think free courses are ever going to go away. Nope. Certainly not in, in our lifetime. So those will, will always be there. And it's just like anything else. We tend to think of disc golf and as being in its own little bubble yeah. where the realities of the rest of the world don't apply. But any other part of life, you want a better car, you want a better uh, golf course, whatever it is, it takes money to make it. And so you're going to have to pay a little more. We don't want to exclude anybody. Um, and, and, you know, in my mind, the, the hundred dollar a weekend course costs a lot less than that for people who live locally and play all the time. Yeah. Right. Cause we don't want to price them out. We want to take care of them. Yep. So I think, you know, the, there's going to be a whole range of options. W w nobody's ever going to, you know, in our lifetime say, I can't play disc golf cause it's too expensive. That's that's just not going to happen. We'll 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 be able to take care of everybody. Yeah. Okay. Here's a question for you to keep this going mm. here. What's your favorite? Is it even close? What's your favorite course you've ever designed? That's the first question. <clears throat> do you have kids? I do have kids. Who's your favorite? I know, and <laughs> I and I have an answer. No, I'm kidding. I don't have an answer. One of my sons. <laughs> that's awesome. For someone who doesn't have kids, that was like the greatest response. I could have just heard that. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So then can I say, um, so you're saying you can't pick even a top three. I could, uh, I could pick a top 10, you know, cause favorite, there, there's so many factors that go into favorite, right? There's, you know, yeah. the dealing with the owners and the property and maybe something that happened while you were there. So there's, there's a lot involved. I, I, I will say, <laughs> go ahead. I take, I tend to get most excited about, you know, what I'm working on now. And mostly because I'm able to do things, uh, let's say, at um, Hickory Cabins that I haven't done before. I'm, I'm doing things at Agape in Pennsylvania that I haven't done before. So I'm, uh, that's really exciting for me. And so, but I don't want to forget, uh, you know, <laughs> how how great Sela Ranch is and how great Hillcrest is and how great Frost Valley is. And let's not forget Harmony Bends. Yeah. I love all my children. That's the problem. So you said children, but I would like to think you're more of an artist <laughs> or an architect. And in that sense, as an artist, even me, I love photography and art. I agree. The one you're working on in the moment tends to be. So I can agree with that. And I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I, I want to know who, who's played the most John Howe course designed courses. Is there a stat on that? Is it John Howe? Has stat. John Howe <laughs> actually played <that? laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, there, you know, there, there are plenty of times when the last time I'm on the property is when I show them where the basket and the teas go, yeah. or we come back for the, for the grand opening. Um, and, and you know, we're, we're shaking hands and kissing babies all weekend, but yeah. I, I probably do have that record. Um, cause I've, I have played pretty much all of them at some point. I mean, sometimes until years later, yeah. um, I did meet a guy once who said his goal in life was to play all of them. Um, I'm not sure if he was messing with me. He seemed sincere at the time. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave that up to somebody else to find, to find that stat. But, <clears throat> uh, Matt, uh, Matt, I think we'll probably have somebody contact you, um, to see if we can trademark the phrase that you used earlier in the broadcast, which was, I'd rather be playing a John Howe course. So that might... We might <laughs> At least a t-shirt. Your we agents are going to call our yeah. agents. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of had... 
you know, two things to say really quick. One of them is a question coming up, but we were just talking about, you know, what makes a course great, what makes it pop, what's the eye candy of it. And I think I said this when we were talking about, you know, what's the most expensive or what's the most money I'd pay to play a course. And I've always loved going to a golf course, playing around a ball golf because of the country club atmosphere of it. Everyone's dressed nice. They got a restaurant there. You know, there's a lot of really cool things to that. I'm waiting for that in disc golf. You know, Maple Hill does a really good job and they've gotten a lot better at it with the sap house with, you know, they got hot dogs there. They got drinks there, you know, Coca-Cola and everything like that. You can order pizza on hole 14. It'll be there by the time you're done your round. But that to me, I, I'm always looking forward to that kind of place where people hang out. And I think Maple Hill has done a really good job of that, where you could go there on a casual day and even not even play disc golf, but you'll see a, a majority of your friends that are in the disc golf community go in and play that course. You know, what's that good hangout spot? And I think that's one thing that I think makes a course great. I think that's a really good point. And you, you see... Um, some of that at Sila, mm -hmm. um, you, you're going to see some of that at, um, Agape and some of that at, uh, Hickory Cabins. And you absolutely have that at, um, Flat Creek, which is a, uh, vineyard outside of Austin, beautiful property, great, like nationally recognized wines and food. I think, you know, USA Today had them top 50 bistros in the uh, country or something like that. So you can you can hang out in their restaurant, have great wine, great food, you know, sit on the patio overlooking the disc golf course. And yeah, that is that That's is a big awesome. part of the it overall awesome. experience and, and, and can be part of why it's worth you know, buying the plane ticket and renting the car or, yeah. or driving, you know, 20 hours or whatever it takes to to play that course. And I, I, I'm quite sure we're going to see uh, more and more. And and you have some of that at the um, DGC, too. Yeah. 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 I just want to go out and play disc golf right now, like and especially John House design <laughs> course. I, this Did you know me. it's not, you know, 830 at night, it's pitch black and. I just want to play disc golf. It's I crazy. De I designed my first course this year during COVID, and it was on my property. So oh, we nice. we have a little home course now that shares seven baskets, seven tee pads. It's really fun. It's very fun to play before the podcast. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. You can. Yeah. So here's a question for you. This is kind of like a lightning round question. You may or may not have an answer for it, but what's your favorite non Hauk designed course in the world that you've seen and you've played or you've yeah or you haven't seen but what's your favorite course that you have not designed i feel like this is like picking a niece or a nephew <laughs> where you won't say it out loud but you know you have a favorite niece yeah, or yeah, nephew but, yeah look i i as a rule um don't comment right. on other people's work um you know unless the owner or the owner asks me to mm -hmm. um so I'm going to fly you into my, my property, walk my yeah. home course. It can be your give favorite. A, give a U disc rating. I, on I, it. I, I will say this because it, it is amazing. And I had a lot of great experiences there. Um, when I was designing the uh, Hobbs farm in Carrollton, Georgia, um, pretty much whenever I was there, uh, a very wonderful gentleman named Kelly Leggett allowed me to stay at his venue Flyboy Aviation. Um, he's a great guy. Um, his dad's a great guy. Uh, his dad uh, is in love with my wife. Um, she's cooked several great <laughs> meals for him, and he said, you can stay here anytime you want. Um, so I, I'm not going to say this is the only one, but huge props to Flyboy Aviation. Is that great, where they did the great Prodigy promo when Prodigy first announced their team back in like 2013? Is I feel like Flyboy Aviation sounds like where they did all their promo stuff, and it's in Georgia, you said, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was that was their basically their home course, gotcha. not quite exactly their yep. their home base. But Phil Arthur lives nearby. Okay. Um, yeah. Martin Young lives nearby. Um, so and, and you know and Kelly's. Kelly's a great guy. It's it's a shame that that course can't be open all the time for people to go play it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it is all through their um, neighborhood. And, you know, not all the neighbors want disc golfers coming through there all the time. So that um, but that, it's, it's a great place. And, yeah, great uh, prodigy right right there. Has there ever been a time, John, and this is now just like mm -hmm. a fun fact, 
where you were talking to a property owner and you said, no, I will not do that. And they said, well, that's a deal breaker. Like, was there ever anything that you ran up against where you were like, this is not negotiable for me as a course designer? Oh, not not that I wouldn't do the project, but there was something about it that I that I didn't want to do. Yeah. Um, and they said they said, no, like, that's really like what we want. Like, have you ever had a project that kind of said? Oh, I, I, uh, I don't think we've ever had a deal breaker like that. We, we did have one parks director who said, please throw over the sidewalk. Um, you know, it's OK. <laughs> we'll just put the T a little ways back from the sidewalk. And I said mm, we, and he said, Look, the, the part of the sidewalk in front of the T will paint red and on either side it'll be yellow and that there'll be caution signs for and I'm like, no. We're not huh. we're not throwing over that sidewalk, sorry. Yeah. That that's that's an old school principle. We don't do it anymore. But um, we huh. found a way to, to finish the design without doing that. Good, good. Um, so yeah. Don't don't think there's ever there's ever been a case like that and uh, <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah, we're, go ahead, find uh, it somewhere. Won't, won't now, ever be the case. When you take on these projects, is there mm. anyone else, you know, besides your wife D, who helps you design the course that you're designing? One of our questions earlier was, do you have anyone in mind or any people that you would like mm. to collaborate collaborate with on a design of a course? Do you do that, or is it mostly you? Other than Bill Newman, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, and, and one of the things about, you know, my number of 120 courses or whatever it is, those are all solo designs. Um, that's that, incredible. that doesn't count any time that I was pitching in with somebody else. Um, and it's not that I'm opposed to it, but the way I work and the, the rate of how I work, um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a point where, uh, what's the expression? Too many chefs spoil the Too broth or something. Kitchen, yeah. Um, not to say that other people can't have input. Uh -huh. Um, and there, there have been times if I feel like I'm not really sure this is going to work and I want to have somebody else come out and throw it and, and test it. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I need to move the tea a little further back or a little further up that kind of thing um i have had you know um, people come out and have players come out and, and help me with that kind of testing because i don't want to you know make a mistake and and have to correct it later or, or wish we had done it differently yeah. but you know and and who else is going to want to spend two to three hundred hours in the woods um <laughs> you know just hugging hugging trees all day and talking to yourself i think well, you'd be I surprised I, I feel like there's a lot of people who would do that <laughs> so, i mean we, that? we go out and talk to each you know talk to ourselves you when we go in the woods <laughs> yeah well you know you have a special relationship <laughs> yeah. Uh, so okay yeah i think yeah it's um i'm i'm not opposed to to doing that and maybe as I get older, I, I transition into being the Tony Bennett of disc golf and start doing, you know, duet albums with all <laughs> yeah. these other uh, great well, singers uh, as, as he did. But now at this point, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I know what I want. I'm so focused. And how, how do I say this in, in a way that's accurate? And um, to I have come so far over the last 30 years in just being able to look at woods and see what can happen there. So let, let me put it this way. If I had to design a course with me 20 years ago, it, it wouldn't work because I couldn't, I couldn't teach the old me how to have that vision. It's something that's, that's just come over years and years and yep. years. Um, and, and, and I, I still can get better at it but I'm a whole lot better at it now than I was 30 years ago. Um, so that, you know, that vision uh, to me is, is, is something that really needs to be developed over, over a long period of time. Gotcha. Do you have anything that you would like to wrap up on the discussion of like course design and that type of thing? Um, we're going to move into another topic that we'd love to have you around for if you're willing to do it, but we want to give you a chance to give any shout outs for your course design process or anything else that you think is a topic that was important related to that? Um, well, look, I, I want to give a shout out to you guys. I appreciate you having me here. I sense that Nick 
has something no. he wants no, to no, no, go, no uh, keep going I, I i do have one more quick question i i kind of scroll through the comments as they're coming in and i like to if i find it a good comment or you know i'm, I'm a little biased if it's from a buddy of mine i'll try to give them a shout out and ask their question but no keep going with your shout outs right now Go ahead, Nick. What's the what's the question? Uh, one of my friends, Pete, asked, um, what were your first few designs? You can kind of like, what were the first two courses you designed? Uh, the very first course I did was uh, Zilker Park in Austin, Texas. Okay. That was in 1984, and it was temporary for the first few years. We just set it up to have tournaments there, including uh, especially the Texas State overall championships. <clears throat> the second course I ever did, speaking of uh, learning how to design in the woods, was in Athens, Texas. And uh, there are you know, maybe three or four holes through the woods there. And the first one, which is the first woods hole I ever did, it's actually only about 60% in the woods because it tees out in the open. Um, I went out there and I said, well, it looks like, you know, we can we can go out to this tree and then turn left a little bit. And turns out discs do not fly that way. So um, they might now. First, not, and I don't think they've ever changed it. Yeah. So if you ever if you ever go to Athens and go to hole number two and go, who designed this crazy thing? Um, that was me before I knew I knew what I was doing. I gotta so move I've down to Texas. Go play all these Hawk designed courses. This is crazy. Well, well, there's you know, and 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 honestly. Um, 10 years ago when, when, uh, I started at the IDGC and when, when D came into the business, everything changed for me. Um, at the IDGC, when Brian Graham said, <clears throat> this is going to be our place to experiment, to try new things. And I just started doing things there, um, that I hadn't done before. I, you know, I, we all really wanted to push ourselves and that just kind of took my career, you know, and my, my design style in a different direction. <clears throat> and I've been refining that um, over, well, actually, yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's about 15 years now. Um, I guess I've probably been saying it's 10 years for the, for the last four or five years. Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, things, things kind of took a different direction for me there when I, you know, more strategy more recovery opportunities more par fours and par fives with defined landing areas and all the all the things that i think are are important but man you, yeah you go back to to zilker back in the day when everything was a par three and um uh, i think everything at in athens was um uh was a was a par three so and you know and honestly some of those older designs uh, have been here and there redesigned by other people. Um, and that's, that's part of life. So if you do go see any of those courses, you can't necessarily blame me for everything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, epic. these days, what's that? I was just saying epic. I started off the show by saying like, if I had to choose and I did, I did give a clarifier to that, you know, what you want to trademark. Now I said, I get to play Maple Hill anytime I want. Yeah. But I will say this. So it, maybe it's my second favorite, but I, I have and I went up there with my wife in his Canadian National Championships playing the course felt magical up there in Hillcrest. I would love to anytime play another Hout course. You can you can trademark me on that. I'd rather play a Hout course. It's it's an amazing experience. Hey, you well, designed we, it we very well. We haven't discussed about that yet. Oh, we haven't discussed the <laughs> prices, Nick, but we'll, <laughs> they can use they can use it. OK, um, oh, so, okay. yeah. Tell me, we, tell me what the price of that endorsement was too. <laughs> one free round at this hundred dollar a weekend course. No. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. All right. Sounds absolutely. Good. Do you have anything that you'd like to close out with? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Props to you guys. Um, I didn't get a chance to give props to uh, to our great friend Todd Rainwater. Yes. Um, who who made everything happen in Nantucket Super and who's good. now responsible for making things happen with the DGPT along with Jeff. And um, I cannot I cannot thank my wife enough. I swear to you, I would not be here uh, today and doing what I'm doing. She took such a risk to leave uh, what she was doing in her life to come join the the disc golf uh, industry and her financial contributions, her business sense. She she really created how design to be what it is, and it would would not exist without her. So Again, I thank her and shout out to yeah. Dee, and thank you God that that I've been so blessed 
to have the opportunities to be able to to try to make a living doing what I love. And I've got to work on so many great properties with so many great people and and meet so many great people, um, which now in, includes Nick. Um, <laughs> Matt Matt was already on the list, um, and, you know. And and I just hope that what I do um, can can help people somehow in you know make their life a little bit a little bit better. And I and I just want to thank all the players for their support. Um, all the all the people who are enjoying the courses and and you know giving us good ratings and I I really appreciate that so again I I feel I feel very blessed and um, it's onward onward and upward man I'm I'm not done absolutely and my uh, my best work is still ahead of me so well we totally appreciate having you on the show we don't want you to think that we undervalue your time we know that you're busy we know that you've got things going on other more pressing things than our show we are going to continue on though and you are invited to stick around nick and i are going to have some hot takes on the pro discussion and what it takes to go pro is that something you want to stick around for or what do you got um are you bowing out yeah i mean it's 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 kind of sounded like a kiss off before the invitation <laughs> but no I, no I appreciate that and we have had we have had some things going on that have required my attention but no i'm i'm good i'm enjoying this okay. I, you know unless people are on the chat saying get this guy out of here <laughs> get this guy uh, out no ex ex exact opposite okay. you are the reason they're watching this show. yeah so Oh, I know. They, they, they don't they, come for Nick and Matt. They come for the, the <laughs> guest. We've had, we had on, on. okay, people <laughs> that are much more. In Pretty, the, I was going to say this. Simon, actually, right? yeah, Terry. We've had an incredible Hannah guest Hannah McBeth. List. Yeah. Um, Dave Hunter Felberg. Thomas of Foundation. <laughs> it's like, we, it's we're not stupid. We know people aren't going to watch <laughs> yeah. us. So we got to get on the people who they will watch. So we do appreciate it. So yeah. we're going to take a hard I guess we'll call it a right turn here and we probably won't go more than 20 minutes, but we'll see where it takes us. Um, hey, I'm loving the comments. <laughs> we are going to turn in this conversation to how, how do you know when to go pro one? And then how do you do that? Nick sign you, up for the PDGA as a professional and you just went pro disc golf. Well, technically, <laughs> just technically, well, actually, technically, yeah, that, that is true. And, um, John, this portion of the show here, we're just going to be rapid fire. If you have a point, cut us off. Okay. <laughs> we may yeah. stop at some That's point to off. invent it. Yeah. Just oh, yeah, you can, yeah, jump in. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, all, all manners completely just jumped out the window. <laughs> we are going Nick and Matt show after dark. So Nick, yeah, you are, you are in the process, Nick, of what I would consider trying to make your way onto the tour. Like that's your process. Okay. Yeah. You've played in a handful of disc golf pro <clears throat> tour events. I think you've played in a national tour event. I don't think I have yet. No, no. Maple I've, Hill I've, at one point was, but I, I didn't play okay. it back then. Okay. I, I think I've skipped over national tours, but I have played worlds in 2018. So, okay. so you're trying, am I, am I, I describing accurately? Yeah. I really want to go to hall of fame classic. That is like hundred percent a bucket list. Okay. Tournament to go to. So that's a but tournament. Yeah. Yep. But you as a person, you've been playing for a while. And at some point you decided, I don't want to stay in the am division. I want to continue to get better and mm -hmm. play pro. I'm just going to clarify for the sake of description of players. It's not that I don't want to play the best that I can, but in my mind, I don't believe I have the time or mm. the life's situations right now for me to ever go pro. Uh, so like, that's the difference in players here. Like, I do not think that will happen for me. And I don't, would I like to play the best I can? Yes, I'll say that again, but I'm not planning to, or trying to go pro or on the tour. You are in a different boat and that's the player we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The player like Nick. Now you just hung out down in Virginia. And I'm pretty sure you are with the best disc golfer in the world and another player who has decided recently to go pro named Brody Smith. Now, has he achieved in six months or a year's time what you've been trying to do for years? That's weird. Well, it, it only took him 72 days to get on a feature card at a pro tour event. I think it took me six years. I think... I've been playing for six years when I won the AM side and played feature card. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but seriously, no, Brody, Brody's done a ton of really accomplishing things into our sport. And he's one of, and I'll say this hot take real quick. 
Brody is one of the few people in the sport, especially at that professional level, um, that are taking it beyond seriously. You know, there are, and I see it and I see people out there, there, there could be random people in the U S that I don't know, obviously, but Brody's out there grinding, you know, Brody wakes up and he's actually, he hasn't posted much on YouTube because he wants to just solely focus on getting better at disc golf. And, you know, when I was down there last week, you know, for, you know, just a few days ago, I just drove back. We would go out and play the course that Paul designed, the course that they're having the tournament at. Brody doesn't get to play those courses down in Texas. And so all of a sudden, this whole new area of disc golf was just introduced to him. And all he wants to do is go out and get better at that course. You know, that's the kind of disc golf he wants to do. And so he's out there grinding to do that. Brody obviously has a natural ability of throwing a regular Frisbee. He was incredible. He was the best ultimate player in the world at one point. Throwing a disc golf disc and a Frisbee, I know, is two completely different things. But he has the talent. He has the athletic build to really push forward. And he knows what it takes to be a professional. It's it's crazy because he's been at that point. He, you know, this is coming from him. This is coming from other people. I don't know the ultimate world very well. But Brody at one point supposedly was the top ultimate player. And him and I were talking about that. We were like, you know, how do you, how do you get to that point? What do you do to do that? And he said, he was like, look, when we did practices, we were doing three days of track practice. They were in the gym every single day, days that they weren't doing those two things. They were, you know, Brody was practicing shots all the way down the field. He was practicing his hammers. He was practicing patent pending backhands to a player running downfield. It's incre- incredible. A lot of the people that I know trying to make it in the pro scene or that are already in the pro scene are not working as hard as what other top athletes are doing in their respected sports. And that's just, I'm sorry, but that's just a fact. Don't be sorry. Um, I think you're I'm right. Not. I'll, I'll say that right now. I'm not working <laughs> as hard as I should be. And just going down there this last week. And one of the, one of the reasons I go down to Virginia is obviously to see my all time best friends. I go down there and have a good time. I get to play disc golf with incredible people, but it's kind of like a motivator because I watch Paul play disc golf and it is just easy to him. He throws the disc far putts going from 45 feet, dead center chains four times in a row. And I'm just like, that, that looks amazing to do. What is it like being able to do that? And so then I come back home and I say, you know what? I got to put in the work. Paul put in the work. Brody is putting in the work. I got to make sure that I am putting in the work myself. So <laughs> that, that was John. That was Nick's. I love when Nick just takes the show away like that because he's got people always to tell say. me I need to talk. To, people I always actually, say I got to talk more. He does. That was, that was all very well said and, and right on. And you're hanging out with, with, you know, guys who exemplify all that. <clears throat> I'd say if, if you want to be a top ultimate player in the world, you have to be an unbelievable athlete. And that's starting to, to translate over into disc golf. I think ultimate throwing skills probably translate over into disc golf a little, a little more than, than you might think. Um, I mean, I've played ultimate my whole life and, and th- there is more of an overlap, but when it comes to being pro, there are a lot of things that golf does really well. And why wouldn't they, they have a 400 year head start on us, but we never, we're maybe just now starting to get to the point where you can turn pro because there's a financial incentive for you to do that. Right. The whole history. Well, not the whole history. When I started playing, I went pro right away because there was no such thing as amateur. Right. There was only there was only the one division and uh, winners got money. So we were all pros. But, you know, it's been peer pressure up until, you know, just recently uh, where the the PDJs made some good decisions and, and things have happened economically in the sport where. If somebody is a thousand rated or close to it and they want to stay an amateur for the rest of their life, they can do it, right? Which happens in golf. But in golf, why would you? Because you're that good. You can be making a lot of money and and doing golf for a living. And we're starting to get to that point. So that whole, you know, when do you do it? Why do you do it? is is just starting to become a lot easier in in disc golf than it's ever been. So what does it take? 
to compete as a professional and there's obviously two or there's lots of discussion avenues here but one is local okay so nick what's the reality for some you're experiencing this what's the reality for somebody who is local and i'm i'm going to use the word local whoever's listening to this picture your local professional okay um whether they're rated 980 990 a thousand whatever that is picture your local pro for instance james conrad is a local pro to virginia Okay, like the people mm -hmm. there, he's the best rated in the state. All right, mm -hmm. like we have a best rated in Massachusetts. Picture, uh, picture, maybe not your best rated, well, but somebody there. the best rated in Virginia. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, I don't think he still comes up no, as Virginia. He he claims California. Okay, so that's why. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm that's why. I just you. saw it recently. Yeah. I, okay, but like, so picture maybe your top three as opposed to maybe the best if they're on tour already. What's the reality, Nick, that you faced and maybe a lot of other local or even we're going to say there's another step regional. So let's say for where we are in Massachusetts, the New England area. Mm -hmm. What's the reality when you step out of there and you go up against 50 of the best players in the world? Like, what's the reality? Do you get woken up or is it like, oh, it's the same thing? Oh, no, it's a huge wake up call. When you go out on the road and play a pro tour event, there's a massive wake up call, at, especially being in New England, of how how much we are lacking in certain areas to be a good local pro you need to be good at every part of disc golf you don't need to be great at it absolutely not you just need to be good and that needs to be your weekend it's really not there are great players that come out of every state don't get me wrong shout out right now to casey white just jumped a thousand nine that's insane massachusetts as i don't think ever had a thousand nine rated player bobby copperthwaite down in uh connecticut was labeled as, you know, the guy who took down McBeast, the McBeast killer back at um, 2013 Greater Hartford Open. That's a dude who was good at, or great, excuse me, great at everything. He had, a, I think, a lefty sidearm, which was kind of weird, but he, because he's a righty, he's a righty uh, backhand player, but phenomenal putter, had the distance and everything like that. Me right now, I'm not the best forehand player in Massachusetts. I'm not the best backhand player in Massachusetts. I'm definitely not the best putter in Massachusetts. But when those three things are working for me that day, there's no doubt in my mind that I will be anyone in New England. And there's five people off the top of my head in Massachusetts that I, I know they could say the same thing right now. If it's their weekend, they absolutely 1,000% could compete with anyone else in New England. But, but we are not in competition with a lot of other areas in the country at the moment. You know, take, take the Charlotte disc golf scene. How many thousand rated players have come out of North Carolina? How many 10, 20 players have come out of North Carolina and Massachusetts has never had a single one because we don't play courses that build those certain strengths. Like, you know, everyone always says, what's it like living next to Maple Golds? And believe me, it's incredible. It's awesome. But if you're having an off day, you're going to lose three or four discs, especially during a practice round where you're throwing multiple discs. Hole five, if you hit the first three, that disc is gone. Hole eight, if you come up short, that disc is gone. So yeah, it's great to live there. But at the same time, it's very hard to practice certain shots. Like when I went to Arizona last year, dude, I don't throw 450, 500 foot backhand hyzers. <laughs> I, I don't have to practice that in Massachusetts. And it wasn't until I went out on the road to like really feel like I needed to practice those. And then, and then now Simon living here and everything like that, him and I have gone out for practice rounds. And yes, that has kind of opened up my mind. I really quick want to respond to that comment from Josh. <laughs> I've seen your comments all night. I don't want you to think we haven't been saying them, but J row from the Cape is 1021. Not a propagator though. Oh. And he only plays one or maybe two C tiers at Burgess every single year. <laughs> I'm sorry, but getting called out. Yeah. He's not, so, a, he's not a propagator. So he's not even listed. If you interesting. go on the statistics, right interesting. Now. So let me take, but he's a good player. I know J row. He's a great player. I play with him a couple times, but Let's take the conversation here. So you're, this is exactly the yeah. path we wanted to go on, is to ask this question, Nick. What were the things, though, that you think are going to make you ready to go on tour? The same thing that we saw with Casey White. And I'm not going to I'm going to bring up and Nate Sexton <laughs> may laugh if he listens to this show. Nate toured with Paul for what was it? A year? Was it two years? Yeah, it was a while. A year or two. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's where Nate got his success, but spending time with the best players, there's no doubt about it that it helps your game. And so we look at Casey spending a lot of time with Simon Lazat. You've spent time with Paul a lot. You spent time with uh, Simon a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
has that helped Why your do game? I still suck then. No, no, I'm, no, no, I, I'm no. asking the question. Yeah. Does that help your game? And do you think what does it take for non people who don't have that opportunity? What does it take for those people to be able to get bet, good enough? Do they have to just mm-hmm. test out the waters with yeah. a pro tour event, like continually just testing them out, testing them out? Paul has always told me. Nick, if you ever want to go out on the road, be the best local player in Massachusetts. Win every single tournament locally. And I think that's a great – because then you get into that winning mentality. I obviously know when I go out to a pro tour event right now, I'm not going to win it at the moment. You know, I think of myself in the future being in that opportunity to where I will win a pro tour event, preferably the MVP Open. But I think I've played maybe seven pro tour events. I've cashed at one of them and it was my home course. And that is frustrating to me because I have put in a lot of work. I have put in a lot of effort. One of my worst things on the pro tour have been my first rounds. My second round and third round are usually rated higher than my first round. I don't know what the heck's going on, but yeah, one of our comments just came up your work ethic in that area. You know, if you're struggling with putting at a pro tour event, go back home and start practice putting seven days a week, multiple times a day. Like, you know, don't do it to where your shoulders getting tired. One of of the funniest things I hear people say is, you know, Oh, I just put up 5,000 or 10,000 putts in one day. (laughs) And I just laugh at it because I used to try to put up a thousand free throws a day when I played basketball. And when your shoulders are getting that tired after that many shots, you develop really bad habits. And so if you're practicing 10,000 putts a day, you must have the most beefy, perfect shoulders out there because anyone else who's doing that dude i i could not do ten thousand putts in a day my i would develop the worst hitches in the world because of how tired my putting stroke would be by the end of that but no work ethic is a huge thing for the up-and-comer um and that that's really to be honest that's really it it's your work ethic i mean if you got a full-time job after you're done your job you really need to go out and just consistently practice Today, I was hoping to get at least an hour of practice because I woke up, I went to work. Unfortunately, work went a little bit over, so I came straight here for the podcast. Would I love to get in an hour of practice at least an hour? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it was Kobe Bryant who said it. When you're really, really, really working towards something, you forget to eat. Or when you're really, really, really working towards something, you forget to sleep. It's about forgetting some of the other Well, I guess my career... My career must be really important because yeah, I forget to forget, eat yeah, and sleep exactly. and all these things. No, the, the people who are really <laughs> making it are are living, they're You're breathing, right. and they're dying disc golf. Let right me now. ask John this question because he's an awesome guest that's been sitting around. And honestly, just I'm sure you have a lot of wisdom to bestow here. But a question for you. What sport, and I'm kind of setting no this pressure. up here. What sport, what other sport can you go professional without ever having been actually coached, like having a coach? Skateboarding. Like, is there? <laughs> well, I mean, if, if, if you say um, you, you pay your PDGA dues and you're a pro, I don't know that it, that it happens in, in many other I sports. I guess I'm talking maybe. specifically, I'll, I'll define it <laughs> more simply, to, to be a, a contending pro at, a, say, a pro tour event, a contending pro, what other sport? Like, like, Right. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it depends, it depends on what your background is and, and how easy it is for you to adapt. Look, disc golf is like golf. It's you against the course, right? So <clears throat> um, being able to play a lot of good, challenging courses that develop your skills, that's really important. But um, Nick is absolutely right. Being able to play with and, and watch and just, you know, be with and learn from the best players in the game, that's huge. I know back in the day when the um, PDJ National Pro Doubles Championships, which we used to have at Round Rock, it's one of the top 10 tournaments in the country, and all the best players were there every year, and I was the TD. And, you know, the week after everybody left, I would play so much better than I did before just from and not from studying anything anybody did, but just kind of having the vibe of, that comes off all those great players. And, and you just get a sense for, you know, something they're doing with their body or maybe something they're, they're doing mentally. So even though it's it's about your skills and being able to play the course, 
the the um, uh, ways that you can elevate your game by being around other great players. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I don't see how you get to the anywhere near the top without without being able to have those opportunities. I a thousand percent agree with that. And there have been people, and it's annoying and funny at the same time. But they will say, "How come you are not better at disc golf? You were best friends with Paul Macbeth." I do not put in nearly as much effort as Paul did when he was my age or that he does now. And that's just the flat out straight up answer. I just don't at the moment put in the effort that he did or does. And uh, that's just kind of like my take on that. But what personality. And so we talk about work ethic. You're saying like, I, I don't right now. Yeah. Is there a personality then? And I guess we can look at the best player in the world right now. Paul, is he it's mama mentality. What is that? Like, he's literally like, it's just, it's just focused. Like, yeah. that's the only thing that I care about right now at this point in my life. No, that can't be true. He's married uh, to Hannah. Yeah. No, no, no. Him, <laughs> him, him and Paige have the same mentality kind of in this situation where if they don't win, who cares? I mean, excuse me. If they don't win, they don't care about second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place. They, they absolutely do not care. They would. It's not important to them. All that's important is winning that tournament. I think Paul said this in his greatness documentary that came out back in 2014 or 15, where he said, I hate, I have a, more of a hate for losing than I have a passion for winning. And I hope I didn't misquote that because he's one of my best friends and that would be really <laughs> rude of me. But uh, no, I, it was, it was something on the lines of the, the lines yeah. along with that. And uh, I, I, uh, I get that. I mean, losing sucks. It really does. And in disc golf, you're the only one to blame for losing. And that's what I love about disc golf is because it's no one else's fault. If I lost a basketball game, how easy of an excuse is it to make of, you know, oh, hey, it's because Matt shot like crap tonight. You know, it's something <laughs> like that. That's why we lost basketball. When I go out and I lose a disc golf tournament, dude, my putting was horrendous today. I got to go and I got to work on those putts. That's, that's the beauty of it. And they both have that mentality of they want to win every single time time there's nothing but that is the difference to them. that's the difference is that and i know this for a fact i've heard people say it even top 20 players in the world they say hey just give me a top 10 finish every time and let me make that cash for the weekend and i'll i'm happy to stay on the road and i think to myself I'm like how how can you have that mentality of you're doing something and you are incredibly gifted you're blessed to be doing what you love to do and you just look at it as oh yeah let me make that thousand bucks a week right now let me make that paycheck maybe 800 700 bucks and you don't think of like, why wouldn't you want to win that event? You know, I, I just, I don't get that, man. Okay. So that's a, these are, I'm, I'm yeah. loving this. I, I do have on something these. to say, kind of what John was saying <laughs> yeah, and what you asked, what sport could you, you know, go pro in and be able to keep, compete with top professionals when Brody, and I know we're bringing Brody and Paul up and everything like that, but this was an actual conversation that we really talked about all week. Brody had been playing disc golf for about 75 days before he was slapped on the feature card at Waco. And all of a sudden, thousands of viewers are watching every single move that he was doing. And everyone was just waiting for him to make that mistake. Luckily, he played decent at Waco. He made less of a fool of himself than I did when I was on a feature card. And he had been playing for less than 75 days. What other sport could you play for 75 days and go and compete against three of the top players in the world? That's like... Me play, let me, Matt, let me go play 75 days. I'll practice every single day of golf and I'll go play with Tiger Woods, Brooks Kepka, and Ricky Fowler. And let me not make a fool out of myself. There's not another sport in the world where that would actually be viable. And it's funny, we were watching the UFC fights because they had a sick UFC 251 was awesome. And we were all joking around that I'm kind of a skinny guy. Everyone knows that. <laughs> we always said, you know, Nick, why don't you drop down to the 125 weight class? you're six inches, eight inches taller than the rest of them. You'd be dominant at it. I'm like, all right, guys, that's it. That's the sport. That's the 75 days. I'm going to practice every day UFC fighting. And, you know, I'm going to go to Wisconsin, talk to Ben Askren about wrestling. And in 75 days, I'm going to be a UFC fighter. I'm going to go fight one of the best in whatever weight class that is. I forgot, lightweight, banterweight. I don't know. I'm, I'm bad when it comes to all that. But no, on a serious note, there is just not another sport where – Give me 75 days, and that's what I'll be able to do. But in those 75 days, Brody practiced harder than anyone else in the country, I bet. So, obviously, practice. What's your, what's your take here, John? Yeah. In real quick, yeah. 
um, because I, 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 no offense, but I understand now why why it's the Nick and Matt show. Um, <laughs> this is the first week it's been the Nick and Matt show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, Nick is good. You're both awesome. Um, but all of a sudden I'm thinking, how much baseball did Michael Jordan play before he became a pro baseball player? Right. I mean, he, he must have been focused on best. How much baseball did Tim Tebow play before he became a pro baseball player? I don't know the answers. I mean, I can't imagine either of them spent more time on baseball growing up than they did on um, uh, basketball or, or football, as the case may be. Um, and, and, you know, probably um, somebody like Brody has an opportunity that's not ever going to exist again as People keep getting better and better and better. Um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna take more and more to be able to get to that level. Um, so, but you know, some some people are super talented and and can do a lot of things well. Um, they're very rare, obviously. And and I'm glad we know now um, why uh, Nick didn't make the NBA. It's because he did too many practice free throws. Yeah, exactly. My free throw percentage was awful because of how many times I spent practicing it. No. Yeah. And a valuable lesson now for your disc golf. Career. Exactly. Well, we've been going now for two hours and five minutes. This is running into the end of our show here. We've talked about a lot of things. You've bestowed a bunch of awesome nuggets of course design and everything else along that. Again, I think your courses <laughs> are tremendous. We are, it was, it was awesome to have you on the show. Um, this, Thanks. this conversation about pro turning pro, how to get to pro is, um, it's, it's a conversation that I think could continue on obviously. And maybe it will, Nick's going to keep trying to get to a thousand rate and then maybe mm -hmm. he'll be fine, but <laughs> then I'll stop talking about it. What are you now? 990? 990. 990. Yeah. Okay. So D is my next test. He's on his way. That's, that's, what's good here. Um, so John, again, we want to say thank you. We're about to wrap up the show. Where um where can everyone find you on social media? So I always try to give you know a little bit of time for our guests to plug in their socials. Where can we find you? Uh, actually, kind of on a COVID break because I'm not out you know on the courses taking pictures and all that stuff. Um, but I'm on Twitter. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram. John underscore Hauk underscore door disc underscore golf, I think. Um, Facebook page is uh, John Hauk, comma, Hauk Design. Um, so not not hard to find. There's not a lot of Hauks out there uh, in the disc golf world, um, except there is a guy in Pennsylvania, right, whose last name is Hauk. <laughs> um, and I think maybe a woman in Pennsylvania whose last name is Hauk, too. But anyway, I appreciate that. If you're if you're trying to find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, it's not hard to do, and I'm just trying to cover up the fact that I don't have all my screen names and locations. <laughs> just Google it. You're yeah. on Wikipedia. Exactly. Maybe it's you're there. Looking, you can find me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, it's 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 been great being with you guys. Uh, I I am sure the day is coming soon when people tune tune in more for you than they do for the guests. Um, so keep, keep at it and, and you're, you're off to a tremendous start. Thank well, you, I do. We loved having that. you. It was, it was incredible having you just the knowledge of course designing, what makes a great course, just all the ins and outs of that <laughs> has been incredible. I'm really excited. The next John Howe course that I do get to play, hopefully be Hillcrest. I mean, I'd love to get up there when all this pandemic stuff stops. So Hillcrest, well, come, come to Agape in central Pennsylvania. Yes, that's not too terribly far for you guys. That's that. Hopefully it's there before the end of the year, and that's uh, definitely be worth the trip. For I got you. no issue with driving, so. <laughs> yeah. All right, well. Just put it. Well, stay safe out there, John. Uh, Nick, you have any final words for the show? Yeah, thank you for everyone who tuned in listening. For all the future podcasters listening on all of the different platforms that we are on, leave us a comment. Um, I did want to make a quick shout-out, really quick, um, on the Disc Golf Network Hannah Macbeth and Christine Jennings are starting up their own podcast. They're actually three episodes in. It's incredible. It's called The Party Podcast. Give it a listen. It's a lot about women's disc golf and kind of the ins and outs of that. And uh, yeah, I really just want to give that a shout out because that's something that is not in the disc golf world right now is more talk about women's disc golf, the FPO. And they're, they're doing that now. So super crazy. 
the party on the disc golf network. Check it out. Thank you very much, everyone. Please like, subscribe, comment, do all those great things. And Matt, I'm going to be in Michigan next week. Okay. I don't know a hundred percent if I will be able to do another remote call. It might just be the Matt show next week. No, but we'll uh, no, I'm just kidding. We'll probably we'll do a remote call again. But anyways, everyone, thank you very much to everyone who tuned in. And thank right, you guys. again, John. Yeah, John. We'll talk later. Yeah. Everybody else. Peace. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Nick and Matt show. Be sure to check us out on your favorite social platform and to subscribe on iTunes. 